Well, welcome to our gathering. But I have a question. How many of you here believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Can I see a show of hands? Well, praise God, that's great, but why? Why do you believe it's the Word of God? You and I glibly cling to that. In fact, we're gambling our eternity on that. But it's interesting, not everybody believes that, and you're going to need to know why you believe that, because I think dark times are coming. I have an interesting article that was handed to me yesterday. The headline says, The Catholic Church No Longer Swears by Truth of the Bible. The hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church has published a teaching document instructing the faithful that some parts of the Bible are not actually true. The Catholic bishops of England, Wales, and Scotland are warning their five million worshipers, as well as many others, drawn uh, to the study of Scripture, that they should not expect total accuracy from the Bible, and that goes on and on to indicate that some of it's not really true, and it's, 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 it's very useful but not accurate, and on it goes. Very typical of man, many denominational statements, and the Catholic Church, of course, doesn't surprise us on the one hand, and yet this joins the key issue. Is the Bible really true? And that's what we're going to take a look at. How did we get the Bible, and what is it really? Where did the texts of the Bible come from? How did the so-called canon, that is the authoritative uh, version, uh, get defined? Are the manuscripts reliable? And how accurate are our translations? Which version is best? And that sort of thing. How do we really know that the Bible is the Word of God? That's what we're going to deal with. You and I live in a time of authority crises. There's parental authority being challenged in our homes, marital authority being challenged in the courts and elsewhere, political authority everywhere being challenged, academic authority, ecclesiastical authority. All these things derive, of course, from a basic concept of truth. It's interesting to notice that if we take any of over 80 indicators, social indicators, most of them were improving up until about 1963, and then they started to deteriorate rapidly. Divorce rates escalated. Families broke up. The acceptance of homosexuality became commonplace. The advent of teenage pregnancies, the murder of inconvenient babies and crime rates, all these dramatically change in 1963 and following. Why? What happened that year? That's when we outlawed the Bible in our schools and in our culture. You know, there are actually only two worldviews that one can hold. One worldview says everything that we experience is simply the result of some kind of cosmic accident. The other view is that what we experience is the deliberate result of a creator. There's really only two views. There are variations of each of these, of course. We all get confronted with four basic questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And to whom am I accountable? And depending on your worldview, that will lead to your response to those four questions. See, we, the rejection of authority actually had its roots in Genesis chapter 3, right at the very beginning. Genesis 3 opens up, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The first introduction of Satan here in this narrative, the first thing he does is raise a question about the Word of God. Yea, hath God said? The next step, of course, is straight denial. God, you, sh you shall not surely die and so forth. Only through the accountability to the Creator God, who fashioned human beings for moral obedience and high spiritual destiny, do we experience the results of human dignity and true freedom. Anything other than that leads to anarchy. Most of us have probably heard that the skeptical theories about the Bible, most of these have collapsed if you do your homework. The fact that the patriarchal accounts in the Bible are actually historical, has been doubted by many, but has been corroborated by archaeological and other evidences. Many said there was no, they, it wasn't even writing in Moses' day, and that's been proven to be false. The fact that the Gospels and the Epistles were written in the second century, in other words, 
over 100 years after the fact. And all of these have been shredded and refuted by archaeological discoveries, documentary discoveries, and competent analysis of what we have. So these common skeptic, uh, skeptical assertions are invalid to anyone that's going to be diligent and do their homework. The Scripture says, 2 Timothy 3.16, that's easy to remember because of the 3.16, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. A very familiar verse. This all Scripture, all Scripture, not just certain parts that you might select. If you try to believe those parts of the Bible that you accept and reject the others, then it's you, you're believing in yourself rather than in the Scripture. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Now, that word inspiration there actually is, in the Greek, is God-breathed. That it's not just influenced by, it's actually God-breathed. That these, these are words that God uh, chose and selected. Are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. Reproof would be for wrong conduct and correction for wrong doctrine. And as we study the epistles of Paul, for an example, um, we discover that Romans is a, the doctrinal statement on soteriology or salvation, and 1 Corinthians, the reproof of that, and Galatians, the correction of that. The book of Ephesians presents the doctrine of ecclesiology, the background of what is this mystical thing we call the church, and Philippians and Colossians, the reproof and correction for that. And 1 and 2 Thessalonians present the doctrine of eschatology, study of the last things. We discover, the more we study the Bible, the more we discover that it's very well organized, specifically for its purposes. And uh, now we have the whole package hangs together. One of the things we should understand that even Peter includes Paul's writings when he speaks of scriptures. In 2 Peter 3, the first 16 verses, it's clear that Peter is regarding Paul's writing on the same equivalence as the collection of the Tanakh that they had in the Greek called the Septuagint version of what we call the Old Testament, that uh, they recognized that uh, Paul's writings were other scriptures. Paul, in fact, cites Luke alongside Deuteronomy, puts them together as scripture in 1 Timothy 5 and elsewhere. The scripture itself declares its divine origin and integrity all through the scripture, and I'll leave these notes uh, the, the uh, passages for your notes to look up, look up uh, when you get a chance. But you'll discover the Scripture itself declares its integrity, that it's all of divine origin. And, uh, and Jesus, by the way, pre-approved this through the Holy Spirit in the Upper Room Discourse in John 14, verse 26. So one of the things you'll discover very quickly, that if you buy any of it, it all ties together. There's no excuse to buy part of it, not the others, because you're, you're causing it to deny itself. If you want to reject the whole thing, then reject the whole thing. But if you're going to accept the thing, you accept the total package because it has integrity. That's what we mean by that very term. Now, how did this actually come about? Men were specifically chosen and prepared for their uh, uh, preparation of these documents. Jeremiah speaks of that. Paul alludes to that in Galatians. They wrote exactly what God wanted for his communication to the people and through them to the world. And... Uh, we now discover, as we examine the text more carefully, that there are all kinds of messages in the text that disappear if you change one letter. You begin to realize that the Torah, the books of Moses, apparently were given to Moses letter by letter, in effect, whether he realized it or not. And I'll show you some examples of that before we're through. That we have here an integral package and uh, that uh, God superintended, watched over every detail. And uh, now subsequent human transmission is, of course, subject to errors and losses. When man gets in the act, it messes things up. And indeed, when we speak of its precision and its accuracy, we're talking about the originals. As it gets translated and communicated, indeed, there are errors introduced. And that's what we have to be very sensitive to. Now, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament and the New Testament revealed. In other words, it's one book. It has an, integra in, uh, in, an integrated design. And once you discover that for yourself, it'll change your entire perspective on every passage in the Bible. 
One of the things we find all through the scripture are what would be called in the computer field a macro code, anticipatory macro codes. They demonstrate an origin of this message from outside the time domain. History is detailed in advance. We'll discover again and again and again there is an element introduced early that makes no sense except in the context of an event that will occur a thousand years later. In other words, the planting of that idea or uh, concept came from someone who knew what was going to happen well in advance. And uh, the, uh, an example, we'll, we'll encounter many of those as we go through our study, but just to give you one example, when Moses is told to raise a brazen serpent in the wilderness, Numbers 21, they had some serpents that were uh, killing people. Uh, he went to the Lord, the Lord says, raise a brass serpent on a pole on a hill, everyone looks to it, will be spared. And he did, and they were. Now, you can read the entire Old Testament, and that makes no sense. Why would God use a brass serpent, of all things, on a hill? And uh, brass, of course, uh, Levitically is a metal for judgment, but the, the serpent is a symbol of sin. Everybody that looks to the sin on the pole is going to get healed. That doesn't make sense. You go through the whole Old Testament, you'll find no allusion, no explanation. In fact, uh, many centuries later, that brass serpent's still around. They're worshiping it. The king has to take it. King Hezekiah has to take it and destroy it because it was becoming an idol. What's going on here? It will make no sense until you get to John chapter 3 in the New Testament where Jesus himself explains to Nicodemus that it was in effect a symbol anticipating the cross of Christ. As Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be raised up. And suddenly the fog lifts. Suddenly you realize that it was a messianic anticipation of Jesus Christ and so on. We find dozens of those laced all through the scripture. And as you discover that, you begin to realize you have an integrated design you're going to reject it, reject it, but don't accept or reject parts of it. It's a package that hangs together. The inspired canon. The word canon is obviously nothing to do with military stuff. It has to do it from the Greek word canon, which means a rule or a standard of measurement. And that's when they speak of the canon, the words that are God-breathed. There are many useful books of those early centuries that scholars study, but they're not God-breathed. That doesn't mean they're not valued for or lexicon or understanding what people may have believed in those days, but they're not inspired by God. The canon are those that were evidenced by the early church as, 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 uh, in a very special sense. This all began with the Torah. The five books of Moses were placed in the Ark of the Covenant along with the Ten Commandments. That was the first beginning of the veneration of the narrative, the text, and so forth. And the whole idea of the canon is based on two convictions, that the words of the Scripture are God's own words. And secondly, that man simply transmitted what he received. So man may have influenced the form, but not the content. The content was God's. That's the distinction. God's own words. The Old Testament presents it as God's actual speech. In 1 Kings 22 and Nehemiah 8 and in the Psalms several places in Jeremiah, Clearly, the intent is, is the representation is the, these were literally God's own words to whom he was speaking. And, of course, the Old Testament specifies and details the Messiah centuries in advance. The Old Testament is the story of a nation that was brought forth to present the Messiah, and the New Testament is the story of that man. And the man is validated by all the details that were anticipated hundreds of years before he was born. Once you establish that who Christ is, he then in turn authenticates the whole package. Christ fulfills the specifications beyond competent dispute, and he then authenticates the Old Testament scriptures having, uh, having established his identity. And so that's our epistemological approach. The first thing you need to do for yourself is to establish the integrity of the design. Not because I told you or anyone else told you. Find out for yourself. Discover that these 66 books, even though penned by 40 different guys over several thousand years, are an integrated message. Every detail is there by deliberate design. And once you discover that, then out of that comes the identity of a person, the identity of Jesus Christ. We know who Jesus Christ was by his fulfilling those specifications. Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion, was a, an excellent portrayal in many respects, a, rem a remarkable piece of work on the one hand. On the other hand, it doesn't really communicate 
who Jesus Christ was. And uh, in fact, the other thing to understand is that the crucifixion of Christ was not a tragedy. It was an achievement. He, he had, that, that's been planned before the foundation of the world, and he faithfully uh, went through that process, that program, for your benefit and mine. We need to understand it was an achievement, not a tragedy at all. And so once you establish the identity of Jesus Christ, he, of course, authenticates the Scripture. The first thing he does after his resurrection is give a couple of guys a seven-mile Bible study, starting from Moses, going through all the way the, the Psalms and the rest, pointing out that every word there is, is, references he himself. So that's our epistemological approach. Epistemology being the study of knowledge at scope and limits. How do we know anything? Well, this is the way we're going to deal with this issue. By one cataloging, J. Parton Payne's Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, he catalogs over 8,000 predictive verses, verses that forecast the future, on 1,800 different predictions, on over 700 different matters. This is just one cataloging, but the point is the Bible is prophetic. It's not just a quaint collection of tribal history over the centuries. It is far more than that. It is a, a supernatural in its origin, and it demonstrates its authenticity by manifesting an origin from outside the dimensionality of time altogether. You need to discover that for yourself, however. One of the exercises we do in some of our other presentations we take just eight of 300, there are over 300 prophecies of the first coming. We take eight of those, the fact that he was born in Bethlehem, the fact that uh, he, he was, would uh, present himself as king riding a donkey, the fact that he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, the, the fact that uh, that transaction would occur in the temple and the money would end up finally in the potter's hands. All this was predicted centuries before, that uh, he had wounds in his hands, that he would make no defense even though he's innocent, that he would die with the wicked yet be buried with the rich, and that he would be crucified. These are just eight prophecies, and by ana analyzing the circumstances surrounding each one, we come up with an a priori probability of each one being individual. The, the probability that a single person would fill all eight turns out to be an enormous number. In fact, uh, uh, that exercise, applying uh, combinatorial probabilities, is actually staggering. I encourage you to check it out. The main point is that this establishes his identity probably more, with more certainty than probably any other identity on the face of the earth. I'm more certain that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel than I am of my own name. And I can demonstrate that mathematically, but let's us, for this purpose, keep going on here. The most, and, and those eight prophecies are the easy ones. It skips some of the most amazing ones. The fact that the Old Testament lays out in great detail in Genesis 22 and Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 are narratives that are just astonishing in their precision. Psalm 22 reads as if it was dictated first person singular while he hung on the cross. It opens and closes with his first and last statements and it describes what he sees as he hangs on the cross. Written, you know, s several hundred uh, years before the fact. Isaiah 53 describes the purpose of the cr cross and its achievement with more detail than all of Paul's epistles put together, and on it goes. He has his genealogy laid out in advance, and uh, the, day, the precise day that he would present himself as a king to Jerusalem was laid out in advance with such precision that Jesus held them accountable to know that day. Their failure to recognize that day is the reason, according to Jesus' remark in Luke 19, that Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. So the precision and the accountability is uh, all there clearly laid out in the Scripture. Now, what's man's role in all this? From the standpoint of form, the human writers contribute to much to the making of Scripture, the historical research, theological medita uh, meditation, linguistic style, etc., there are figures of speech that were unique to those people. There are over 200 different kinds of rhetorical devices, figures of speech, that are used in the Scripture. So man's role, the, the majesty of Isaiah is one thing, the pragmatic uh, pastoral rhetoric of Amos being another, and so forth. Um, the the, uh, the uh, personalities of the writers show up in the form, but not in the content. And that's an important distinction. Theologically, from the standpoint of content, the Bible regards the human writers of having contributed nothing 
It was the, the content is God's direction. That's what we mean by God breathe. And the, these are things that you need to explore and determine for yourself, but these are the, what make the Bible distinctive. In fact, as we begin to understand more carefully the, uh, the Bible from an information science point of view, we discover that the integrity of that design of the total package manifests a strategy to uh, avoid hostile jamming. It's interesting that you can't, where's the chapter in the Bible on baptism? Where's the chapter, chapter on salvation? Take some subject, some critical subject. Where's the chapter on that? You'll discover it's not in one chapter. If you're a communications engineer and you're designing a message system anticipating hostile jamming by an adversary, one of the things you do is you take your message and spread it across the available bandwidth. And that's exactly what the Bible has done. And that's what Isaiah mentions in Isaiah 28. That I've established my truth line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. It's deliberately spread that way because you can tear a, any page out of the Bible and not lose any of the doctrines. You may lose clarity on some issue, but uh, it's, uh, it, the, the whole design uh, has been designed, and it's been designed in anticipation of jamming, interestingly enough. The more you know about communication engineering, the more fascinating that all is. And uh, some of you know I've written a book called Cosmic Codes, Hidden Messages from the Edge of Eternity, which attempts to look at these things from the point of view of an information technologist, from, cryptog from uh, cryptography and uh, so forth. And so I commend that for those that you might have interest in that. But one of the critical aspects in examining your Bible is its authentication. There are many scholars that claim that Moses didn't really write the books of Moses. They were really written by somebody else, some other scribes and so forth, and just attributed to Moses. And you run into those theories and it undermines your confidence. Except the point is Jesus attributes the Torah to Moses. So if Jesus is who he claims to be, then that's authenticated by the highest authentication possible. And uh, anyone that believes in Jesus Christ has no problem in the authorship of the Pentateuch or the Torah. Now, if you don't, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you've got bigger problems than the authentication of, of uh, the books of Moses. But clearly, Jesus himself authenticates it. Uh, Moses. The Torah is quoted 165 times directly in the New Testament with over 200 allusions. So the point is each one uh, validates the other, if you will. And Jesus on the Emmaus Road, one of his first acts after his resurrection is to give a seven-mile Bible study to two guys uh, in which he demonstrates that Jesus Christ was uh, 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 presented in the scriptures, and he does this as speaking in the third person. Didn't you know that Jesus was to do this and to this and this and so forth? And a very, very interesting uh, event. He said, uh, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Not just here and there, all the scriptures. And one of the discoveries you need to make for yourself is that Jesus Christ is on every page of the Old Testament. Some very clearly, some very indirectly, but always there. All the scriptures, he says. Jesus said, think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now a yacht and a tittle are Hebrew expressions. A yacht is one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet that you and I would mistake for an apostrophe. It's just a little mark, almost like a blemish on the paper. A tittle is the little tiny decorative hook on certain of the letters. And this is the, uh, equivalent to you or me saying um, one yard or one tittle is the same as saying uh, what, not the dotting of the I or the crossing of a T will pass. This is a call to literalness. Jesus clearly uh, indicated that we should be taking it very, very literally, very strictly. Now, there's a couple of terms get bandied about, inerrancy and infallibility. What do we mean by inerrancy? That the Bible contains neither errors of fact, that is material errors, or internal contradictions. Those, they're called material errors or formal errors in the, in the documentation field, but the point is we're talking here the originals, what they call the autographs. It, it contains neither errors of fact nor internal contradictions. Infallibility is the subjective consequence of design inspiration. That is, it's reliable and trustworthy, 
to all who turn in and search for truth. So those are two terms that are well defined. However, it is subject to imperfect transmission. Inerrancy is attributed only to the original autographs, and it recognizes the potential imperfections inherent in their transmission, copying, translations, and so forth, and also the potential cultural, historical, and rhetorical gaps between the writer and the reader. And there are gaps that can be overcome by diligent scholarship. But the important thing is less than 1% of the Scriptures are under competent dispute. Unfortunately, no doctrine of the Scriptures depends on any of the disputed passages. There are disputed passages, there are issues that scholars ponder, but they don't impact any critical doctrine. Let's talk about some other terms. Uh, the word Bible itself is derived from the Latin, from the Greek word Biblia, which is diminutive of Biblos, which denotes any kind of written document, but originally one written on papyrus is what it originally meant. Of course, today the term is, uh, has achieved a very high venerated status. The word testament, we speak of Old Testament, New Testament, comes from the Latin testamentum, from the Greek diatheke, which is uh, most of the occurrences in the Greek Bible, actually means it, it means a covenant rather than testament. The word testament really has changed its meaning in modern thing. It's really a covenant. It really should be the old covenant, new covenant, but be that as it may, we'll move on. Now the Hebrew Bible, which is what we're going to primarily focus on in this session, uh, the Torah, of course, is the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, the most venerated portion of the Scripture, especially to our Jewish friends. Then a section called the Prophets, the Nevi'im, the former prophets and the latter prophets, and they would include Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings in that category, interestingly enough. And then the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the book of the Twelve Prophets. The Twelve Prophets we call the Minor Prophets, not because they're less important, but they're smaller in size. It's, it's a librarian's term. They're small books. But there's twelve of them, and they would call them the Book of the Twelve Prophets. And then they have the section they call the Writings, Kedavim, the, the Psalms, Proverbs, Job, and five scrolls, which include Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther, and also Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. So that's the way the Hebrew Bible would be divided up. They have their books in a little different order. We take Samuel and Kings and split them into two, and, and um, Chronicles into two, but basically they're the, essentially the books just in a different order. Then we're familiar with what we call the Old Testament, what they would call the Tanakh. The Tanakh being a an acronym of Torah, Nevim, and Ketuvim. Okay, the Hebrew language. The Scripture says, Genesis 11, verse 1, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And I'm among those that believe that that original language was Hebrew, a proto-Hebrew perhaps, but still that it was Hebrew. The Hebrew language has some distinctives that no other language on the planet earth has. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but clearly that's where it all started. One of the peculiarities of the Hebrew language is that the alphabet itself is semantic, not just phonetic. Most alphabets of most languages are phonetic. If you know the letters and how to pronounce them, you can pronounce the word. In Hebrew, if you know what the letters mean, you can make a good guess as to what the combination means, not just how it sounds. And that's rather remarkable. The Hebrew language is also self-parsing. Meaning that, uh, see, the, uh, all the early languages were written without spaces between the words. That all came later. In the Hebrew, it has five letters that are, have a slightly different shape if they're the last letter of a word. And because of that, it's possible to read Hebrew without knowing the spaces between the letters, interestingly enough. So it's a very different, uh, in some respects, far more advanced language than most people realize. And the language, the, the alphabet, is all consonants, no vowels. It's a, what's called a consonantal script. It's like uh, for building, you have BLDG. We do that all the time. You know, building number three or something, we BLDG, you know what I'm talking about. You don't have to put all the vowels in there. Or boulevard, same thing. And um, the vowels, in effect, are implied. It wasn't till the 9th century A.D. that the Masoretes developed what they call they developed conventions for the way the vowels were always inferred, but as time went on, they saw the need they, to, to to put cues in there as to what how what vowels are missing. They do that by putting little tiny marks above and below the letters. That's called pointed script, and the pointing conventions were developed in the ninth century by the Masoretes. But uh, okay, now 
the Hebrew language is astonishingly vivid, concise, and simple on one hand, but it's so dense then it makes it difficult to translate fully. It takes sometimes a two or three times as much space to translate the Hebrew into English because the words carry so much significance on their own. And, uh, and so it typically takes twice as many English letters. Or, or letters. Every Hebrew word is, cons is composed from a three-letter root. And uh, the verbs are formed from three-letter roots with forms developed by a change of vowels or by adding suffixes or prefixes. To put a few letters in front or back to to amend what it might mean by itself. The root consonants give Hebrew a semantic backbone and stability that's not characteristic of Western languages, on the one hand. On the other hand, it also leads to wordplay. The verb usage is not characterized by precise definitions or tenses. They, uh, they're very context-dependent. And because it is, that lends itself to wordplay or puns and that sort of thing. And so there's a, a often far more carried in a, in a Hebrew sentence than it would be, say, in a Greek sentence. And now the Greek language is just, the, is just the opposite. It's a very beautiful language, rich and harmonious. It's a very fitting tool for vigorous thought and religious de, uh, devotion and also argumentation. Because uh, Greek is very, very precise. And it, that gives it a strength and a vigor, the language of argument, a vocabulary style that could penetrate and clarify phenomenon rather than simply describing it. Where, where Hebrew would describe it, with Greek you can get, reach inside and tell what's going on in a sense. And how does it do that? By uh, the, uh, the, the precision, and I'll come to a few things there. The uh, classic Greek, sometimes called the Attic Greek or High Greek, is subtle in the syntax and very expressive in the use of participles. Sometimes it's not even possible to translate them into English there, and capture the full nuances of it. And so this was the culture at its zenith, was the Attic Greek. The Koine Greek, or Common Greek, uh, was the result of Alexander the Great, as he encouraged the spread of the Greek culture. Uh, all, all throughout the world, the regional dialects uh, were replaced by Hellenistic or Common Greek. It's simpler and less elegant than the Attic Greek or the High Greek, but it nevertheless retains most of the strength and beauty of it. And that is what the New Testament is uh, written in, is the Koine Greek. And uh, so give you an example, let's take a Greek verb. The Greek ver every Greek verb meets five aspects. It has a tense, a mood, a voice, a person, and a number. And from the verb itself, you can tell, all co it'll convey far more than just its definition would convey. It'll tell you, in effect, who is performing the action, whether just one or more than one is doing it, when it is done, whether it is single event or a process, whether it is an actual happening, a command, or something wished for. In other words, what we think of contrary to fact, subjunctive, or imperative, and so forth, it uh, obviously includes all of that. And uh, whether the subject of the verb is active or passive, we have active voice or passive voice in the English. The Greek also is a third, where it's both, the optative. And that's what causes many people to misunderstand some of the things in, in uh, Paul's epistles, because they're not sensitive to the Greek uh, uh, syntax. And so a single Greek word can require a phrase or sometimes a whole sentence or even more in another language. So Greek is incredibly precise and expressive. And so Greek and he Hebrew is very, very different. Well, what did Jesus speak? Well, his common language is Aramaic, as Mark 15 highlights. He also spoke Greek, as he did in Mark 7. He spoke initially to Greek, in Greek, to Mary in the garden that morning, until he had, and she didn't recognize him until he addressed her in Aramaic and heard the sound of his voice in the Aramaic. Pilate himself, interestingly enough, personally wrote Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. He apparently knew enough Hebrew because he was in charge of that region. That was his, his assignment. Uh, he spoke Greek because that was the common commercial business language of that day. And he spoke Latin uh, because of it was the official language of the Roman Empire. And as the years go by, it, took, it takes uh, uh, several centuries before Latin displaces the Greek throughout the Roman world. But the, uh, Pilate spoke all three, interestingly enough. Now, there are many non-canonical books. There's a group called the Apocrypha. The word means hidden, by the way. 
and these were formulated about 300 B.C. to about 70 A.D. There's about 13 of them that happened to be included in the Septuagint translation. And they were embraced by the Council of Trent in 1546 as part of the package, but um, not recognized by the church as canonical, they were, but they were in existence at that time. Then there's also a group of the pseudepigraphia, which are books that ha are, were false. They were written under pseudonyms, and uh, there's 54 of these. They're very curious things uh, scholastically, but not taken seriously by the early church. So you'll run into the non-canonical book. These are books that were not regarded by the early church uh, as inspired by God. They have characteristics that would exclude them from being in the canon. There are a group of books that are lost to history. They're alluded to in the Scriptures. The Book of the Wars of the Lord is mentioned in Numbers 21, and there's a whole list of them. The Book of the Just, the Book of the Acts of Solomon, and so forth. These are lost. We have no idea uh, what they said, uh, where they are. They're just illusions. They are lost writings and, and as remain the subject of conjectures by scholars. Um, and there are, from time to time, false versions of these that surface but then are discredited for one reason or another. What we really want to focus on is the Old Testament texts, the Hebrew texts. The original Hebrew was pulled together in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, and it was called the Rolaga as a group. And uh, in 285 B.C., Ptolemy Philadelphus funded the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. In those days, Greek was the standard language of business. Most people, even if you were Jewish, spoke Greek. They used Hebrew much as a Catholic uses Latin. They used it for ceremonial purposes, but many Jewish people didn't really have facility in Hebrew, and they desired to have a copy of their scriptures in Greek. So Alexandria in Egypt was in those days one of the major literary centers of the world, and they funded 70 scholars, some would say 72 scholars, uh, in Alexandria to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And uh, some say there were six from each of 12 tribes to make 72. There's different versions of the details, but the point is the, their, their work product was finished in 270 B.C., from 285 to 270. It took 15 years. And that, the product that they produced is known as the Septuagint translation. Septuagint being simply a fancy word for 70. It usually shows up in an abbreviation LXX, which is 70 in Roman numerals. But that's the Septuagint. And this is a very valuable document for many reasons. First of all, it gives us a precise Greek rendering of the Old Testament. It is also very prominent because the prophecies in, that are detailed in the Septuagint were in black and white virtually three centuries before Christ's ministry. So the existence of those prophecies are beyond dispute. And... Uh, Another reason it's so significant is that that translation became the Bible of the early church. The early Christians used the Septuagint translation along with the letters of Paul and other letters that were being circulated as their scriptures. And uh, now meanwhile, there's a, the Hebrew text, by, by the time you get to the ninth century, the Hebrew text was uh, codified by the Masoretes. These were a group of scribes, and their, their product was called the Masoretic Text. Your English translation of the Old Testament is a translation deriving from the Masoretic Text. And it, in turn, really had its roots in the Council of the Omnia, which occurred about 90 A.D. Obviously, the, Israel rejected her Messiah, crucified him. As he predicted, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D., that gave Judaism a huge problem because they were taught that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, and they have no way to shed blood when the temple's gone, so they've got a real problem. And they have a council to deal with this, and that council really redefines Judaism into a religion of works and, 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 and of good works and so forth. But they also undertook a revision of their uh, uh, Vorlaga, their, their Hebrew text, and gave rise to what ultimately becomes the Masoretic text, the text that we have in our Bibles. The Council of the Omnia, they were upset because the Septuagint was uh, used by the Christians, so they, want, they rejected the Septuagint. They uh, wanted their own Bible, if you will, and so they made their amendments and so forth. 
and they produced the unified text of the Tanakh, and uh, they got rid of anything that didn't agree with it. They destroyed, and that uh, their Tanakh becomes the Masoretic text later. And so, so the Masoretes, these are a body of medieval scribes and Tiberius uh, that were charged with the Old Testament text preservation from about 500 A.D. and codified about 950 A.D., so called the, the, you know, the 10th century. And uh, they're, they're the ones that also uh, invented the way of uh, putting, representing vowels in the Hebrew. And uh, the oldest dated manuscript is uh, 895 A.D., um, and uh, it is only part of the three major sections. The Torah and the Ketuvim are missing as far as that particular uh, manuscripts concerned. The Hebrew text today is largely dependent on what's called Codex Leningradensis, and it's stored in the Leningrad uh, Public Library, and it's used as the primary text for most Hebrew texts today, and depending on uh, 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 which Hebrew text you have in your, in your word processor or whatever, it comes from, it'll come from the Leningrad uh, Codex. It was copied about 1008 A.D. from texts written by Aaron ben Moses ben Asher. And uh, we also have a thing called the Samaritan Pentateuch, 4th century B.C. now. This differs from the Masoretic text in about 6,000 places, of which 1,000 need to be taken seriously. And where the Samaritan Pentateuch disagrees with the Septuagint, excuse me, agrees with the Septuagint against the Masoretic, it should be regarded as significant. In other words, you've got a Samaritan text that's 4th century B.C. You've got the Greek translation of the Old Testament in the 3rd century B.C. When those two agree and have something different than the, than the Masoretic text has, which is 900 A.D., uh, that's probably a result, a deliberate result of the Council of the Omnia, where they've diddled with it. And... Uh, so the two oldest codexes of the Samaritan Pentateuch are in the are 13th century, 12th and 13th century in England, in uh, in, in Manchester, England, or Cambridge, England. Um, now, there's an Aramaic Samaritan Targum of the early Christian times and an Arabic translation of the 11th century. They also exist. And uh, now the Aramaic Targums, Aramaic became the official language of the Persian Empire in the fifth or sixth century B.C. and uh, the, uh, so they, there's a number of translations. One of the most highly venerated of these is what's called the Onkelos translation. And uh, it's among the rabbis highly regarded. And there are some very interesting differences of the Onkelos translation and your King James. An example of that is in Genesis where Enos was, was the, fir the, the first son of Seth, was the one that led the... Um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, teaching against God. And it's just the opposite. In King James is a mistranslation. It's well known among scholars, probably footnoted in your Bible. A lot of that comes from the Onkelos translation. And there's several others. We don't have to go over each one of these. The Peshitta is a, con is a contra uh, very controversial uh, document. It's an Eastern Aramaic version in common use in the Syriac church. Peshitta simply means the plain or simple version. Uh, its literary history is very complex and problematical. There's a lot of debate exactly um, where it came from and what its history is. And uh, there aren't any big particular doctrinal issues out of this. It's just uh, it has some, uh, uh, where it really came from is a, a, a point of scholastic dispute. It doesn't affect any of our uh, direct issues anyway. The most important series are the Septuagint, the Greek translations. There's a number of them in papyri, the papyri, Unsealed. Unsealed is a, a, a style of all capitals and usually without spaces. It's, very, it's, the, way they, it's the way they are. There's hundreds of these, of, uh, and, and uh, a lot of these uh, 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 were found in the second century B.C. and following. Uh, Chester Beatty is one of the most uh, important collections, and that's the uh, uh, second through the fourth century A.D. Um, and there's a lot of pre-Christian parchment uh, fragments that are in various libraries. It's about the 4th century that vellum starts to surface, and there are three important um, codexes, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Alexandrinus. All three of these really had their origin in Alexandria, Egypt, and we're going to talk more about them before we're finished. And uh, they are 
among the oldest complete manuscript. There are fragments that are older, but these three are uh, almost complete of the Old Testament, and they're from the 4th through the 10th centuries. Then there's the, the cursive script start showing up, the minuscules as they call them, and uh, that's where there's a cursive script. They appear in the 9th century and, and into the medieval period, and there's a long list of these that uh, uh, we don't have to get into, just they're, they're, there's plenty of them around. Um, the Latin versions show up in the 2nd century, under Tertullian and following, and uh, we have uh, um, uh, uh, fragments of the old Latin. It gets translated, because Latin begins to replace Greek in the 3rd century. So Jerome is commissioned by Pope Nemesis I, and he translates the uh, uh, available uh, versions of the Old Latin into what's called the Vulgate, which is the common, commonly used Latin version. And it's really a composite of the Septuagint, the Hebrew, and Latin, and other manuscripts that were available at that time. And then we have a lot of quotes from the early church fathers that, from this period that, are, that impact our Latin understanding. I'll give you a, a summary of all this in a little bit here. We can't talk about manuscripts without making allusion, of course, to one of the most important finds, and that's the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are 11 caves at Wadi Qumran, over 600 100 manuscripts. 200 of those were biblical. Not all of them were biblical, a lot of other things too. There were 60,000 fragments, many of which have yet to be examined thoroughly. 85% leather, 15% papyrus. In Cave 4, there were 40,000 fragments of 400 manuscripts, over 100 biblical. Every book except the book of Esther was found among those fragments. Uh, there's a number of them at what they call Group 1 at Wadi Qumran and also at Masada. All these predate 70 AD. They all predate the fall of Jerusalem. All of these agree with both the Septu as we understand the Septuagint and the Forlaga. So uh, it's very, very important uh, corroboration of, of the accuracy of what we have in our hands. A second group that are found in a couple of other reasonable, uh, nearby places uh, were hidden after 100 AD. So these are after the Council of Yomnia. All these agree with the Masoretic text. So it's interesting that the, the difference between the Septuagint and the Verlaga on the one hand and the Masoretic on the other, the dividing between that is the Council of Yomnia, where obviously they made decisions and adopted practices to go a slightly different direction. One of the things that give you an example, I, re, uh, I was doing some research having to do with uh, Ezekiel 38, and I happened to stumble into Amos 7.1. Amos 7.1 in your Bible, from the King James, reads as follows, Thus hath the Lord God showed un unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. What does that mean? I have no idea. It makes absolutely no sense to me as it stands. If you turn to the Septuagint, that verse looks very different. There came locusts upon the earth, and uh, let me back up. When you're in the book of Revelation, there's a passage in Revelation 9 which speaks of the locusts upon the earth, and they had a king over them, which is the, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. The locusts have no king, according to Proverbs 30, verse 27. Why is Proverbs 30, verse 27 there? So that we'll understand in Revelation 9 that the locusts here are idiomatic. They're not literal locusts. They're demons of some kind, and locusts is being used as a figure of speech. So from that background, in Amos 7, 1, if you read Amos 7, 1 in the Septuagint, it says, Thus the Lord showed me, and behold, a swarm of locusts were coming, and behold, one of the young devastating locusts was Gog the king. That's in the Greek, the precision Greek. There are some blemishes in the Hebrew that causes the confusing translation as you find in the, Maser in the Masoretic version. Here in the Greek version, it's pretty clear that, that what's being talked about here are locusts in the demonic sense, because Gog is the king. These, these locusts have a king, which means they're demons. And I can remember when I stumbled into this, I was blown away that, wow, could be, because in Ezekiel 38 and 39, this Gog guy shows up, Gog and Magog, with no background, no linkage. And it's very strange in the Bible to find an important person without some kind of explanation or, or links to him. 
And suddenly it becomes very clear that the Gog is a title of a demon king. In those days I was, uh, had a routine where I would spend my Tuesday nights with Hal Lindsey in a study. I'd do a, a service at his church that evening and then I had a breakfast a Bible study the following morning, Wednesday morning. I'd spend the night with Hal in his home and we used to rap for hours in his study at night. Well, I, I, I was all excited because, wow, here's a, a discovery for Gog that I'd never ran into in any, in any of the literature. And uh, Hal dug out his Septuagints and stuff, and we dug out the reference, and sure enough, it's correct. In fact, it's not even a variant reading. It's, it's accurate. And uh, um, I was blown away, but Hal wasn't. That, you know, because uh, here's all these people interested in prophecy, and Ezekiel 38 has been studied for, for centuries. And yet, uh, I never come across any remarks like this in any, you know, anything. Hal was not surprised. He said it's a fulfillment of Daniel 12.4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even at the time of the end, for many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Many people quote this verse as knowledge in general, but the context implies the knowledge that will be increased is knowledge of prophecy. And Hal's point is that as we get closer to the end times, we should not be surprised to make discoveries that have eluded scholars of the past. And that blew me away. I was very excited. His point was that, Chuck, you should expect that. And so... Um, it's interesting, but again, the key to under unraveling the Old Testament was the Septuagint translation in the Greek. And uh, so, the question also comes up now, is the Bible inerrant? Does the Bible have errors in it? And I always, you know, when I was a teenager, I believed in the, believed in the Bible and so forth. I had a, a friend that was the son of a Unitarian minister, so he knew his Bible, but he didn't take it seriously. He said, well, what about Kings 7, 1 seven twenty three? And he'd always throw this at me. Because in 1 Kings 7.23, it deals with Solomon's, this big laver for the temple, which is 10 cubits in diameter, 5 cubits deep, and uh, it has a circumference of 30 uh, cubits round. In other words, everyone knows the circumference is not three times the diameter. And so this is not a big deal, but it's wrong, it would seem, that uh, the circumference is uh, three times the diameter, and, and uh, uh, according to the text, and yet we know it's not three times, it's pi, 3.14159 or whatever. There's this peculiar number of pi that relates the circumference to the diameter. Well, I didn't have an answer in those days, but a ra later, later years a rabbi explained it to me as we were talking about this. If you look at that passage in the Hebrew, the word for circumference is misspelled. And when the Masoretes found an error, they didn't correct it, they made a uh, margin. Uh, uh, an annotation in the margin. The error, the parent error, was called a kathiv, and the corrected version was in the margin called a kiri. And as part of the respect for the text, they wouldn't change it, but they'd annotate what they thought was the correct spelling. Well, the point is, Hebrew is like both Hebrew and Greek. These are two languages that have a distinctive in that each letter of the alphabet has a numerical value, and that is exploited in a number of ways. Under Hebrew alphanumerics, if you take the way the kathiv, the way it was written in the Masoretic text, there's a kaf, a vav, and a he. The way it should be written, normally, is a kaf and a vav. Well, a kaf is about 100, the vav 6, and the he 5. So the, um, the way it is, uh, should be written is 106. The way it is spelled is 111, because there's a he thrown in there at the end of it. Well, if you correct that ratio for the 31 cubit circumference, you'll discover that it's in a length that's about 46 feet, there's an error of less than 15 thousandths of an inch. So it makes that adjustment. Now, some people also point out that that can also be uh, 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 accredited by a hand breath, that that was the thickness of the, of the, of the labor that Solomon's building, and so they, they, they don't see a problem there. But there are something else that comes up with all of this that I have to share with you. Um, there are a couple of constants in the universe that are dimensionless. Uh, there are two of them in, in view here. One is pi. It's a dimensionless constant. Pi is 3.14156, or 159, on and on. Um, pi is the same number no matter what, whether you're in metric or English, how, what, whatever units you're measuring, it doesn't matter. It's a dimensionless constant. You follow me? There is another one that you probably have not run into unless you've been in advanced math. If you had a course in calculus or advanced engineering or advanced mathematics, you've come across this peculiar number called E, 2.7183 and so on. 
I'll come back to that in a minute. There are two major passages in the Bible that have to do with the creation. Genesis 1.1, of course, and John 1.1. Well, it's interesting. If you take Genesis 1.1, and you take it in the Hebrew, and you take the number of letters times the, and the product of letters divided by the number of words times the product of the words, if you do that, it turns out you get pi to four decimal places. Well, that's kind of interesting. And, and, I don't know what you do with that. Curious. It's, it's, it's a little bizarre. John Napier, by the way, is the guy, the mathematician that uh, discovered the, the, the properties of this peculiar number E. He actually was an activist for the Reformation in uh, Scotland. Uh, he's the one that uh, first used decimal points and fractions. But he's the inventor of logarithms. And uh, the natural or Napierian logarithms, named after his honor, is log to the base E. It has all kinds of properties in advanced mathematics. You'll find it in wave mechanics, electrical theory, all the distribution of prime number. It shows up everywhere in strange ways. This peculiar number called E, and it turns out to be approximated by 2.718281828, so on. Anyway, what's interesting, if you take the other major creation passage, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, John 1.1, 1, 1, and you take that in the Greek, and you do the same thing we did with the Genesis passage, the number of letters times the product of letters divided by the number of words times the product of words, you get E to five, uh, four decimal places. Now, I don't know what you do with that. <laughs> it doesn't prove anything exactly. And yet it's interesting that everywhere we turn, we discover properties in the biblical text that clearly went beyond the understanding of the people that wrote it. There's no way you'll ever convince me that John was acquainted with Napierian logarithms and contrived this. No, this is, this is a fingerprint of the Holy Spirit in my view. Along the same line, I'd like to share with you this whole issue, are there hidden messages in the Bible? Big debate these days. The Scripture says so. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, and it's the honor or duty of kings to search out a matter. And uh, a rabbi in the 16th century in his writing said, the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of letters. Very interesting enigma that emerges in the ancient rabbinical writings. And this leads to a phenomenon that is known as the equidistant letter sequence. What do I mean by that? I can take a simple sentence. This is just one contrived to be an example here. Um, Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. If you take in this simple little example every fourth letter, it turns out that that is another message. And if you take every fourth letter, it says, read the code. Now, this is just contrived to get across to you what an equidistant letter sequence that in a sentence you can hide another message by every nth letter, every third letter or fourth letter, some, some particular schema. And uh, mechanically, those are hard to find. There are rabbis that do it mechanically even to this day, but most people today will use a computer to search for these things. Let's take the book of Genesis as an example. And this is the book of Genesis. Remember that Genesis, uh, Hebrew goes from right to left. All languages flow towards Jerusalem. Nations that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left. Nations that are west of Jerusalem go from left to right, interestingly enough. Uh, but in any case, the word for Torah in Hebrew are four letters, a tav, a vav, a resh, and a he, which is equivalent to our T-O-R-H in a sense. If you go to the book of Genesis, starting in the upper right-hand corner, Go to the first tau, or T, and count 49 letters. You come to a vav. Then you count 49 letters again, you come to a resh. And then you count 49 letters again, you come to a he, which in the Hebrew spells Torah, okay? Now, you say, well, okay, that's, uh, so what? That could just be that way by a statistical accident. When you go to the book of Exodus, you discover rather astonishingly, the same thing happens. You go for the first tau, 49 letters to the first vav, 49 letters to the first resh, and 49 letters more to the first, to the next, you find a he, and you have, again, Torah. Now, happening twice like this starts to blow any statistical accident kind of theories, because that's pretty, that, 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 that seems very deliberate to anyone analyzing it. When you go to the next book, Leviticus, it doesn't happen, and you almost feel a sense of relief, probably. When you get to Numbers, something even stranger occurs. It happens, again, with 49-letter intervals, but it spells Torah backwards. 
Now, you, <laughs> this raises a question to my mind. I, they must have had time on their hands. I don't know how they found this. Okay. And you go to Deuteronomy, the same equivalent thing happens. Now, now it's puzzling. You've got Torah spent, spelt forward in Genesis and Exodus, backwards in Numbers and Deuteronomy, each in 49 letter intervals. Let's go back and examine Ec Leviticus, and we discover not a 49, but 7, the square root of 49, and we find that at seven letter intervals we have the Yad He Vav He, or the Jehovah or Yahweh, however you want to pronounce the unpronounceable name of God. And now when you stand back and look at this overall design, Genesis, Exodus, it's spelled forward, Numbers and Deuteronomy, it's spelled backwards, the Torah always points to Jehovah or Yad He Vav He. So, um, now the question is, okay, this is cute, uh, what about it? Uh, there are people that would argue that this just a, is a statistical accident. I don't think so. I think this is the fingerprint of the Holy Spirit. And we find things like this laced all through the Bible, different kinds of things. The word Israel, if the, let's, let's search for the Israel in Hebrew. In the first 10,000 letters of Genesis, searching intervals from minus 100 to plus 100, it only occurs twice at intervals of 7 and 50. Now, to a Jew, those are significant numbers because that every Shabbat, they, uh, they cite the, uh, the Kaddush at, uh, in Genesis 1, verse 23 on. The Jubilee after seven smittas and so forth, the 50 also. Uh, and, and, and there's more to it. I'll, I'll leave that go now. Uh, the trees in Genesis 2. In Genesis 1, 29, God said, I give you every herb-bearing seed which is on the face of the earth, every tree which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you, it shall be for food and so forth. At the end of verse uh, chapter 1 to the beginning of chapter 2, out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life and so on. So from verse one, chapter 1, verse 29 to chapter 2, verse 9, in that segment of biblical text, we find the 25 trees that you'll find in the Bible encrypted in those few, in those, within that space. And uh, uh, so that's interesting. And there are those that would argue, well, that's just a statistical accident, but I don't think so. We also find in Deuteronomy, speaking of the Holocaust, we find Hitler, Auschwitz, the crematorium for my sons, the Fuhrer, Eichmann, king of the Nazis, Auschwitz, several places, Germany, Hitler, Mein Kampf, all these are encrypted there in various places, the so-called Holocaust. In Isaiah 53, we find this, what some people would call the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament. We find the Messiah, Nazarene, Galilee, Pharisee, Levites, Caiaphas, Annas, Passover, a handful of other apparently relevant allusions. But the one that's really exciting to me, in Isaiah, in those 12 verses, you have encrypted the people who were at the foot of the cross. You've got Peter, Matthew, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, James. In fact, you find two, James, uh, two Jameses. There were three Jameses, but the third James was not a believer until after the resurrection. We have Simon, Thaddeus, Matthias. We have three Marys there. Indeed, there were three Marys at the foot of the cross. Salome and Joseph. In fact, one of the Marys is encrypted in such a way as it's interlinked with John, by the way. But even more impressive to me than the names that are encrypted in those 12 verses is a name that's missing. There is a name that, is, that consists of very high frequency letters in Hebrew that statistically should show up in that space by just statistical accident. You'd expect to see it just from raw statistics. And in this case, it's conspicuous because it does not appear. That name is Judas, interestingly enough. So let's talk a little more about yachts and tittles. I want to acquaint you with something. Jesus said, Think not that I come to destroy the law of the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. To me, he's calling attention to even subparts of the letters themselves. One yacht or tittle. I want to highlight briefly some characteristics of the Hebrew alphabet. The, the, the Aleph is the first letter of their alpha, uh, uh, alphabet. That's why it's alphabet. It's the very term alphabet is a Hebrew term, by the way. Aleph, Beth is what it, it speaks of. But anyway, Aleph is, on the right side shows how it appears today in Hebrew. Its original presentation before Babylon in, proto in the early uh, Hebrew 
was like a longhorn sp uh, steer. It represented an ox. So the word Aleph is first, first letter. Also represents like an ox, which means strength, okay? The uh, strength or leader. The uh, second letter is a bet. On the right side is the way it appears today in Hebrew. On the left side is the way it used to appear. It looks like a little teepee, if you will. That little symbol gets turned to become RB, if you will, but that's generations later. The bet is it, it really represents house, house or family, well, that's in the house, the family, like Bethlehem or Bethel, house of God or house of bread or house of God. Okay, so if you take an Aleph and a Bet together, on the right side is the way it would write today in Hebrew, but in the ancient Hebrew it would look like, showing you on the left on the slide there, the longhorn steer and this little teepee thing, the, the, the word Ab, that for the pronunciation at, at A and a B is Ab. What does it mean? Well, the Aleph means the first or the leader, the strength of, and the Beth is the house. So this means it's the leader of the house. It's the Hebrew word for father. Or if you want to say daddy, it's Abba, but it's Abba is the father. Let's go one step further. There's a Hebrew letter called a He. It's a breath. And uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, may, it may represent hands lifted up or an open window. There's all speculations of what it originally meant, but in any case, the letter implies behold or revealed. It also is the, implies a breeze or wind or spirit. It's very similar to the H, where it's a breath. Remember Eliza Doolittle in uh, George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, made into the musical My Fair Lady. The, he had, she had to practice her H's in Hartford, Hereford, Hampshire. Hurricanes hardly happened. She had to practice. Remember, all that. the H is the, the Hebrew equivalent of the H. If you put a H in the middle of a word, it's inserting a breath or in, in that word. So Ahab is, is the essence of the Aleph and the Beth is the father. Putting the He in there gives you the essence of the father. What is the essence of the father? It's the Hebrew word for love. Love is the essence of the father. The point I'm trying to make here is the letters carry the meaning, not just the sound. And that, that, that's, if you... Under the the, the uh, Hebrew Department, of the University of Arizona, pointed out to me that if they teach the kids how to recognize Hebrew in terms of the ancient Hebrew, it takes half an hour to do that, make a list of 22 and learn them. If you can do that, you can. They've discovered the kids can read about 80 percent of Hebrew because by knowing the letters and what the letters signify, you can make a a very informed guess of the semantics that of of, of the passage. When uh, Abraham and Sarah had their names changed. This is the way they were spelled before their name in Genesis 17. When God changes the name from Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah, all he did was add a he in their names. Abraham and Sarah, he in, signifying the presence of the Spirit of God. Well, I want to give you a riddle now. Who's the oldest man in the Bible? Methuselah, good for you. He lived 969. Well, yet he died before his father. How can he be the oldest man in the Bible and yet he died before his father? That's your, little, that's your question for your small group meeting this week. Ask him. And of course, what everybody forgets who his father was, his father was Enoch, who didn't die. He was translated. In fact, when Enoch was 65, something happened that from that point on he walked with God for three, uh, over 300 years. He apparently was given a prophecy that the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. It had been preached on for four generations. But Enoch was told when his son was born that as long as his son is alive, the flood would be with the judgment of the flood would be withheld. So he named him Methuselah, which comes from two Hebrew roots. Muth, which means his death, it occurs 125 times in the Old Testament, and the verb shalak, which means to bring or send forth. Methuselah really means his death shall bring. In fact, if you do your homework in Genesis 5, you'll discover that Methuselah uh, was born, and when he was 187, Lamech was born, and when he was 182, Noah was born, and it was the 600th year of Noah that the flood came. And if you do your math here, you'll discover the year that Methuselah dies is indeed the year the flood come. I always ponder this. Can you girls imagine what it was like raising that kid? Every time he caught a cold, the entire neighborhood would probably panic. But... In any case, if there's all this significance hidden behind, 
the name Methuselah, what about the other ten names in this genealogy in the book of Genesis from Adam to Noah? We have uh, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, and Lamech, and Noah. The problem with these names is they're not translated in your Bible. If you have a lexicon, it doesn't translate proper names. And um, the way you have to uh, unravel these is to get into the Hebrew roots and find out what the, the, the words mean. And since we learned so much from Methuselah, let's take a look at these others. What does the word Adam mean? Well, man, that's a reasonable good. Adama means man. His son was named Seth. And Seth comes from a root which means appointed. In fact, in Genesis 4, verse 25, Eve said when he was born that God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. So the word Seth, she even tells us, implies appointed. Seth has a son by the name of Enosh, which means mortal, frail, or miserable. It comes from the root anash, which is to be incurable, like a wound or a grief or wickedness or what have you. It really means incurable. Kenan is, uh, means sorrow, dirge, or elegy. And uh, his son is Mahalalel. Now, he's probably had enough, because he and his father is named, uh, you know, miserable and so, and so forth. So he decides to end all that. He names his son when he's born Mahalalel. That's a mouthful, but it's a great name. It comes from two roots. Mahal, which means the blessed or praised one, and El, the name of God. Mahalal El. Mahalalel means the blessed or praised God, or blessed God. He has a son by the name of Yared, which is a verb. The verb Yarad, meaning shall come down, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Enoch, we've mentioned already, but what does his name mean? It's an academic term. It means commencement or teaching. And Methuselah, we talked about, means uh, from Muth and Shalak, uh, uh, means his death shall bring. And as I pointed out, it, it was, that was the year the flood came when he died. His son is Lamech. And here's a root that we use in the English. It's still evident in lament or lamentation. It really comes from a root meaning despairing. And Lamech has a son by the name of Noah. How many of you have heard of Noah before? That's about 70%. Not bad. Okay, I'm kidding. All right. But we use the name. But what does it mean? Well, Lamech explains. It comes from Nacham, which means to bring relief or comfort. Uh, Lamech even mentions that when Noah is born, that he shall comfort us and so forth. He explains it. You can draw these even from the text itself. Well, now let's take a look at this genealogy, with this, having had this little Hebrew lesson. And we have Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Let's read it in English. Man, the pointed, mortal, sorrow. The blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death, whose death? God's death, shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Every time I do this, I get goosebumps. Here is what you, a reasonable summary of the Christian gospel tucked away in the early chapters of Genesis. Now, this has several implications. First of all, it's clear that... Um, well, let's put it this way. You can never convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide the Christian gospel in a genealogy in the Torah. No way. But it also says something else. It speaks, of course, to the integrity of design. That's why I bring it in here. But it also indicates that God's plan of redemption was not a knee-jerk reaction to a surprise that Adam blew it. It was planned before the foundation of the world. That's when God first started dealing with you, before the foundation of the world. He had you on his mind. And here's a demonstration of that hidden in the text itself. For our purposes here, the primary implication is that this collection of 66 books, penned by over 40 guys over several thousand years, is a skillfully designed package. Every detail, every place name, every, uh, every detail, every number in it is there by deliberate design. And the, God always rewards the diligent. If we'll take the trouble to dig in, behind each one of these things will be a discovery. And I leave that with you. One integrated. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. This is an example. And of course, the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. I published a book called Cosmic Codes, Hidden Messages from the Edge of Eternity, which includes a background tutorial on cryptography, which of course is what it's all about. Many people writing in this field have no cryptography background. That's really what you need to really understand what's going on. 
And then we deal with microcodes, macrocodes, metacodes, and, uh, and then how to search for them yourself. Um, we do spend some time, but not a lot of time, on the equidistant letter sequences. They're the codes that are so controversial today. We spend out of 25 chapters, we spend two or three on them. But there's far more interesting codes in the Bible, and you don't need a computer to find them. And so I challenge you to take a look at this and find out how you really study the Scripture for yourself. In our next session, we're going to focus on the New Testament itself. How reliable is it? We'll talk about some problem areas and the modern translations that are so controversial in some cases. And I'm going to show you a hidden security mechanism that will assure its authenticity that's been running reliably for thousands of years. And we'll take a look at that in our next session. Well, welcome to the second session in which we're going to explore our New Testament. How reliable are our texts? We'll talk about some of the principal controversies, the King James versus the NIV and others. And uh, many people ask me which version is best. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But underscoring all of this is the fundamental issue. How do we really know that the Bible is the Word of God? And that's our challenge. Well, the New Testament is our subject. The Old Testament that we reviewed in the first session was compiled over several thousand years. However, the New Testament was compiled within one lifetime. So they're dramatically different in many respects. The early church had at its disposal four Gospels. They had Luke in two volumes. It ultimately gets split into Luke volume 1 and volume 2 called the book of Acts. But actually, they really can be viewed as four Gospels, including Acts. Then we have what some people would call the Pauline corpus of letters and the other epistles. And um, these were all circulated along with the Septuagint for instruction and worship. The early church, the first century church, took as their scriptures the Septuagint, Old Testament, the four Gospels as they finally assembled, and these, these body of letters that were written with the understanding they would trade letters. If they, and, and trading letters meant that they also would make hand copies of them. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go. It's interesting for us to realize that Luke and Paul, if you examine their texts, rely on the fact that they're talking to contemporary eyewitnesses. They understood their readers to also have been eyewitnesses to many of these uh, events. And uh, one of the things that is also conspicuous in the New Testament scriptures is the things they don't talk about. There's no mention in these letters and so forth of Nero's persecutions after 64 AD. That's when Nero really started to, you know, blaming the Christians for the burning of Rome and all that business. That's conspicuous by not being mentioned. The execution of James, which occurred in 62 AD. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And when he was executed, you would think that that would get into the letters. What this, is, what this all implies is those letters were written prior to these dates, is the point. A point that's often overlooked by some of the critics. The Jewish revolt against the Romans in 66 AD, which ultimately leads to the fall of Jerusalem. In fact, you really won't understand the peculiar book of Hebrews unless you understand that it was written to Jewish believers while the temple was still standing. That was, it deals with the paradox that was confronting the Jewish believers in those days. And the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD is not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament documents, which indicates they were in existence prior to these historical events. Now, Jesus... Uh, as I pointed out before, his, the common language in that day was Aramaic, but he also spoke Greek and did so in Mark 7. He spoke Greek to Mary in the garden on resurrection morning, uh, and she didn't recognize him until he addressed her in Aramaic in John 20. And uh, Pilate was fluent in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Hebrew because that was, that was his, uh, the territory that he was responsible for. Greek because that was the business language of that day and Latin because that was the official language of the empire. So he spoke 
and he, when he wrote the title himself to put on the cross, he wrote it in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, and did so um, deliberately uh, embarrassing the Pharisees by making an acronym of yod heh vav -Hey in the way he wrote it. And they asked him to change it, and he wouldn't, because he was obviously upset, because he understood that he was delivered up for envy. There are syntactic peculiarities in the New Testament worth noticing. It's interesting that the sentence structure is uh, uh, that he, it was a Hebrew more likely than Aramaic, and Mark quotes Luke in hundreds of places. Mark quotes Acts in 150 places, and Mark knew Thessalonians, Corinthians, Romans, Colossians, and James, apparently, from his writings. So the contemporaneous nature of these things is, uh, is uh, important for us to understand. There are 600 evidences of an early date of Luke. And there's lots of different discussions which came first and what order they are in. There is one school of scholastic thought, commonly called the Jerusalem School, that assumes that the original drafts were in Hebrew. Out of that, at about 40 to 45, comes a rough Greek version. And uh, this uh, de devolves into a Greek and Aramaic variation, sometimes called the Q document in the minds of some scholars. And uh, some feel that the Q document is really the Hebrew drafts, but those are all speculations because we don't have copies of it. Then gradually we have Greek adaptations, and uh, Luke is regarded as one of the earliest, interestingly enough, by this particular school of scholars, followed by Mark, and then followed by Matthew with a heavy influence from the Hebrew drafts, because he is very much, it's very much a Jewish document, if you will. And uh, so then, and John is distinctive on its own right. So that is the profile by many. Now, one of the things that um, is overlooked is the use of a professional stenographer, called an, classically called an amanuensis. That's, the, these documents, you realize, were written by hand. They didn't have printing presses and they didn't have copiers. These were all handwritten. That's why they're called manuscripts. Manu from, they're handwritten, if you will. And it's interesting that there, much of the New Testament was written by professionals. First Peter was written by a guy by the name of Silvanus, who was a, uh, uh, a hyperetes, which it means under rower, a supporter, if you will. And uh, uh, Tertius wrote uh, Romans, and he's mentioned in Romans 16.22. John Mark, the young man, John Mark, apparently had the skill of being a stenographer. And uh, that's why many scholars believe that he was the one that actually wrote Peter's gospel for him, that the gospel of Mark is really Peter. It's very, Peter, it's very much Peter style. It's an action document. It's like a shooting script. And uh, so the point I'm really getting at is these are just three of the cases where we know their names. Uh, it's clear that if you compare 1 Peter and 2 Peter in the Greek, 1 Peter is very polished Greek. It was written for Peter by a professional stenographer. And uh, uh, I assume that uh, Silvana uh, did for Peter what Tracy does for me. Most of, the, most of the documents that you see in the newsletter are her cleaning up the mess that I hand her. And so that's a reason, if, it's, if, it looks, if it looks good, that's Tracy at work. And likewise, Silvanus is evident in 1 Peter. When you read 2 Peter, which Peter wrote himself, it's a very rough Greek, very different style, clearly uh, without the benefit of Silvanus and so on. And so one of the things you need to understand is there was in those days a professional skill that, uh, at shorthand writing. In fact, in Psalm 45, verse 1, in the Septuagint, uh, the way it's translated in uh, your Bible, it, it's in 45.1, it speaks of the ready writer in the King James or the skillful writer in the NIV. What they're translating there in the Septuagint is oxographos, which is a synonym for tachographos, which is a shorthand writer. Now, what's significant about this Greek term in the Septuagint, that was translated three centuries before Christ's ministry, and that meant that that technical term was in common language on the street because it's in Koine Greek. It's not a, a scholar's language. It was the common language. And there was in the vocabulary of the man on the street a term for a stenographer or a ready writer or a shorthand writer. Now, what's interesting here is that Matthew, 
was a former customs official, according to Matthew 9.9. 9. So he would have had to have a working knowledge of typography, which is basically, he, was, he had skill at shorthand. So he would have been able to transcribe the Sermon on the Mount verbatim. One of the reasons Matthew's gospel is longer than the others is because he includes the discourses extensively. He actually, I believe, wrote them out. He was able to. So you have to understand the customs official issue. He spent his day in business correspondence, and they had no copiers or carbon paper, so a lot of writing was required for receipts and whatever, and so that was a skill that was required of a person in that kind of a job classification. So that was a skill that Matthew had. And that also explains why his, his gospel is longer. If you take the discourses out of Matthew, it's shorter than Mark. It's shorter than Mark. What makes it longer is because he has several of the major discourses extensively verbatim. And uh, so that gives us another insight. Something else that's emerging up till this time most documents were in scrolls. We've all seen the scrolls. I, that's why I use the little scroll as my I idiom for the, when I show Scripture on the screen with a scroll. It's from the Old Testament. In the New Testament period, we're beginning to see vellum notebooks where they have pages. What's called a codex is what you and I would call a notebook. When you, see a, when you have pages, that's called a codex. With vellum, you could write on the front and back. Papyrus it was a little uncomfortable around the back because the, the back side was rough. But for vellums, you could write on both sides, and they did. And in fact, in, uh, in uh, 2 Timothy 4.13, Paul mentions the membrane, a Latin word transcribed in the Greek, referring to a parchment notebook predecessor to the subsequent codex, which is the ultimate departure from the scrolls. And uh, he says in 1 Timothy 4.13, The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments, the word parchments there is the word membrane, which is, refers to a parchment notebook. So we're finding in the text these things are starting to emerge, and they, the practicality of having pages rather than these cumbersome scrolls. You could turn right to where you wanted to go without having to, you know, fuss with a 20-foot-long scroll is uh, obviously far more practical. So the, what be, displaces the uh, previous uh, scrolls were parchments, uh, codices. Another thing that we notice in the text that have great significance are abbreviations. Some of you may be familiar with Ziff's Law. It turns out that in language, among other things, when something starts to be used frequently, you adopt a shorter version of that. If you're in biology and you're going to talk about deoxyribonucleic acid, you quickly say, well, that's DNA. If you're... Uh, in uh, political science, and you're going to talk about the North Atlantic Treaty Organization several times in a paragraph, you quickly call it NATO. You adopt what's called an acronym. You take the first letters or some abbreviation. It turns out, it may surprise you to discover that you're doing that follows a mathematical law, that when the frequency of something occurs enough, and it's cumbersome enough, the, if you take the rank, the, if you list your vocabulary, the word you use most frequently and then next frequently, make a list in rank order of how often you use a term, you'll discover the rank order and the number of times you use it is a constant. And that turns out to be a mathematical um, procedure that it minimizes your effort. It's called, in fact, it's called the principle of least effort. But in any case, uh, it's, these kinds of things actually follow certain mathematical laws. Well, it turns out that in the early church, the same thing was true. They're having to handwrite all these things. So there are certain words that be, they, they, for which they adopted abbreviations. And they call these the nomina sacra because the very abbreviation implies a common understanding or common usage or a doctrine. Here are some examples. Christos is uh, in the Greek uh, spelled out with, surprisingly enough, how many letters? Seven letters. <laughs> I think that's interesting. But what they quickly, and writing a lot about Christ, they would use the first two letters to, to represent Christ. And that was not an area of disrespect. In fact, it was indicated, it was a, it was a, a form of respect. Uh, Jesus, Iosus, again, it takes the first and last letter here as an abbreviation. Theos, for God, is a, 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 an abbreviation that appears in these letters. The Holy Spirit, instead of spelling out pneuma, they just use three letters of the Greek. Uh, 
Now, the one that's probably the most interesting is the term Lord, because the word Lord occurs again and again and again in their vocabulary. But where it is referring to God as Lord, it's abbreviated with the, uh, with the Kappa Sigma, the, the two letters. In fact, that scholars make a big thing of that because it indicates that among these writers, they treated the, the term kurios regarding to, to, to God as a special uh, title, uh, unique to God. Not just every time the word kurios might be used, but where it's, uh, it had theological significance. The point is, the use of these abbreviations was deliberate and standardized, and therefore reflected their theological position on these topics. And that's a surprising um, undercurrent, if you will, in the text. Something else that shows up is this, first, this term, the first and the last. In Isaiah, at least three times, he says, I am the first and the last. In Revelation, he also says it several times, the first and the last. In Revelation, he also says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. These are terms, if you're familiar with the Bible, that are, that are very familiar to our ears. There's something that has been overlooked. There's also the same equivalent construction in the Hebrew. Instead of Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, the Aleph and the Tau are the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, the Aleph and the Tau. When the Aleph and the Tau together have a makef, a little connecting bar, and is used in front of a word, then that construction is used as a grammatical element to indicate the direct object of a verb. And that's the answer you'll get from most rabbis about the Aleph and the Tau, but that's only one of four uses of that, that construction. That construction without the makef is used as a pronoun to indicate the second person masculine singular. And that's used in what's called a hypocatastasis, a putting down underneath is what it says in the Greek. It's a kind of grammatical pun, if you will. Uh, it's defined as a hidden declarative implied metaphor expressing a superlative degree of resemblance. Say, gee, Chuck, what does that mean? Well, in Zechariah, give me an example. In Zechariah 12, verse 10, in your Bible, it reads, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they've pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. There are two untranslated letters between the me and the whom. They shall look upon me, and there's an aleph and a tau, whom they've pierced. And uh, so if you look at that in the English, they shall look upon me whom they've pierced. In the Hebrew, there are two letters that are not translated. And those two letters would appear, if they were translated, between the me and the whom. Let me read that another way. And they shall look upon me, the Aleph and the Tau, whom they've pierced. It could very well be that this is an intentional allusion here to the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega in the Greek, if you will. This also occurs elsewhere in the Scripture. I'll give you just one case, and then we'll move on. In the opening chapter of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Here again, there is an Aleph and a Tau untranslated. It doesn't have a Makef. It's not required grammatically. In the beginning, God, the Aleph and the Tau, created the heaven and the earth. And we have, of course, many passages in the Scripture that ascribe the creation to none other than Jesus Christ. And uh, it's all so... Because he, he says, I was the first and the last who was dead and am alive forevermore in Revelation. So we know who the Aleph and the Tau is. It's none other than the person of Jesus Christ. In the early manuscripts, we have 6,000 copies of the Greek New Testament or portions thereof. I want to contrast that to Homer's Iliad, very venerated among Greek scholars, but we actually have only about six, we have 10 times as many New Testaments, I mean ancient manuscripts, as we have Homer's Iliad. And uh, Euripides' tragedies, uh, even half of that. There's also a lapse period for the classical Greek that virtually 800 to 1,000 years between the time the events presumably happened and the first manuscripts we've got, okay? The lapse of the New Testament works is one lifetime. We have documents that record it from within one lifetime, not several centuries and so on. And I want to talk to you a little bit about P64. That's a papyrus that's now been dated before 66 A.D., 
It's a little scrap that includes Matthew 26, verse 23 and 31. 23 on the one side and the back side. It's, it's written on both sides. And it was within the lifetimes involved. I'll come back to that in a minute. There are a number of papyri that are very important. Uh, and I won't go through each one of these to, simply to say that there's a whole world here of manuscript diligence to dig into of these various scraps and things that are dated. Uh, um, all, many of them have been dated like the second, third century or earlier, um, but uh, each with its various uh, controversies. But there is a document, there's a book that was labeled, a strange title, it's called the Jesus Papyrus. It's an unfortunate label, of course, but in 1994, according to the Times, December 24th of 1994, a papyrus believed to be the oldest extant fragment of the New Testament has been found in the Oxford Library. It provides the first material evidence that the Gospel according to Matthew is an eyewitness account written by contemporaries of Christ. Now, what is this reporting on? A guy by the name of Costin Thede, I'll come to him in a minute. Let's back to the papyrus. This, the so-called Magdalene Greek papyrus, 17th slant, piece 64, was a segment of Greek text of Matthew's Gospel that uh, here, there are three fragments, and they're shown here on both sides, if you will. A total of 24 lines, segment of Matthew 26, verse 23 and 31. The first point about these, first of all, the, this text corresponds to Textus Receptus. We're going to talk more about Textus Receptus, which is the principal undergirding of the King James and the one that's been attacked by the so-called modern translations. I'll come back to that. But the early, these early fragments support Textus Receptus. But the more important thing, there's a guy by the name of Karsten Thede, who got permission to examine this scrap, these scraps that were in the custodianship of the Oxford Library. And he brought to the task some advanced technology, a brand new scanning laser microscope. And these things are quite remarkable instruments. They can differentiate between 20 millionth of a meter layers of papyrus. They can measure the height and depth of the ink as well as the angle of the stylus used by the scribe. They can probably tell whether he's right or left-handed. The, the use of this microscope uh, is what um, enabled Karsten Thede to date these manuscripts. And so this is now regarded the uh, oldest manuscript. He compared uh, with the scanning laser microscope uh, with four other manuscripts, one at Qumran dated 58 AD, one at uh, Herculaneum dated 79 AD at Masada, and an Egyptian town of Oxyrhynchus. And the net of his analysis, and published in this book, is that either these scraps are the original of Matthew's Gospel, or an immediate copy, written while Matthew and other disciples and other eyewitnesses were still alive. And so, the more technology we put on these things, the more we can justify earlier dates. Many of your Bible helps say, ascribe the, the dating of some of these manuscripts to being the first and second century. Wrong. It actually is earlier. It's uh, contemporaneous. And uh, so, getting back to the Nomina Sacra, Matthew, the Matthew 26 fragment uses these abbreviations for both Jesus and Lord, showing the very, very early use of these abbreviations. This indicates that the deity of Jesus was recognized centuries before it was accepted as the official church doctrine at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. There's a popular novel going around called The uh, Da Vinci Code that is a spurious, it's a really shabby, uh, 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 shabby uh, document. Uh, it twists history, it deliberately distorts history, but it's also confusing a lot of people. It tries to present the idea that the Council of Nicaea selected the books that would be the New Testament. That's nonsense. The New Testament was well established long before the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea uh, dealt with a totally different set of issues. I won't get into all that here, except to say that a lot of people are confused. Clearly, Jesus was recognized as Lord in his lifetime. That's why they crucified him, was his claim to be God. But also, the early documents also indicate uh, uh, these things. They weren't the result of a church council as such that was several centuries later on other matters. Anyway, Speaking of the Gospel of Mark, Qumran Fragment 7Q5 was written before 68 AD, within 36 years or maybe less, from the resurrection while eyewitnesses were still alive. That's the key point of all of this. I want to get to the Alexandrian codices, because there are three codices that, were, that are the source of a lot of confusion. Codex Alexandrinus, 
it was discovered about 1630, it was brought to England, and it was a 5th century manuscript containing the entire New Testament. The noteworthy thing here, it was a complete Bible. It wasn't just this book or that book, it was a, a comprehensive Bible from the 5th century. In about the 1800s, um, Codex Sinaiticus was found. A German scholar uh, by the name of Tischendorf discovered this in St. Catherine's Monastery at the traditional Mount Sinai. And this manuscript dated about 350 A.D., so again, it's 4th century, is one of the two oldest manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. And then there's another one called Codex Vaticanus, which has uh, been in the Vatican Library since at least 1481, the 15th century. It was not made available to scholars until the middle of the 19th century. It was dated slightly earlier than the previous ones. But uh, anyway, these three are regarded as among the oldest manuscripts, complete manuscripts. Now, don't confuse the issue of how old they are with how complete they are. There are fragments that are older than these are. These just happen to be the oldest ones that are complete. You follow me? And uh, they give rise... Uh, all three of these appear to have had their origins in Alexandria, which is one of the great li uh, libraries in the ancient world. And uh, now these have become very controversial for a number of reasons. Now let's get, get, go through the English Bible and come back to these. John Wycliffe, of course, is the Oxford theologian, uh, most eminent of his day. And he and associates were the first to translate the entire Bible from Latin into English, Wycliffe. And William Tyndale, born in 1494, uh, in the age of the so-called Renaissance, graduated in 1515 from Oxford. He studied Greek and Hebrew. He committed his life to studying the Bible from its original languages for the common man. You need to realize that these guys did what they did under penalty of death. And uh, Tyndale was uh, lured out of his home and then burned at the stake by his adversaries. You, we need to understand that times... This was, these were tough times. Here's a rough history of the English Bible. Wycliffe started with us about 1382 from the Latin. In 1525, Erasmus pulled together the best documents available at that time, most of which were from Byzantium and were in Greek. And uh, what he pulled together in 1525 is sometimes summarized as textus receptus, the text as it was received. It was the, the official uh, primary uh, basis for subsequent translations. Um, in uh, the following year, Tyndale's Bible, uh, for it was the first English New Testament, followed by Luther's Bible, which is the first one in German. Coverdale was an assistant to Tyndale and finished what Tyndale had started. So he really completed what Tyndale hadn't quite finished by uh, 1535. Again, each one of these are doing all of these things under penalty of death. You need to understand the dominance of the medieval church in those days. Then we have a series of the Matthew Bible from Tyndale's Notes, and then the Great Bible, as it was called, because it was very large and very expensive. <laughs> then the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, and then the douay Reims Bible, which was redrawn from the Latin, basically the Catholic Bible. We finally get to 1611, which codifies these things into what's called commonly the King James Version. And uh, James VI of Scotland became the King of England and adopted the name James I. And it was under his tutelage that they undertook a authoritative, final, so to speak, um, translation. More than 50 scholars, the best they could find, and they had a heavy commitment of prayer at each step of the way. And they formed, uh, they, they, were, they drew upon they had available to them 5,556 manuscripts. All the things that were available before was at their disposal, but the primary thing they relied on was this collection of Erasmus called Textus Receptus. This document, even to this day, is recognized by most as the noblest monument of English prose. There's none of the modern translations, while they may be more readable and they have some advantages, none of them have the majesty or the veneration of the King James Version. And we'll come back to that in many ways. Let's talk a little bit about Textus Receptus. You see, at the end of the third century, Lucian of Antioch compiled the Greek text to become the primary standard throughout the Byzantine world. Remember, the capital of the world now was in Byzant Byzantium, not Rome. And from the 6th through the 14th century, the majority of New Testament texts 
were produced in Byzantium and were in Greek, not Latin. And 1525, Erasmus, using five or six of the Byzantine manuscripts, compiled the first Greek text produced on a printing press, and that was the basis for what's called Textus Receptus. So here's a, a, a diagram that tries to summarize some of this. The original Hebrew manuscripts assembled in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah were called, were called the Vorlaga as a collection. It gives rise in the third century before Christ to the Greek translation, the Septuagint, the LLX, if you will. Very important points to realize that the Old Testament, we have a copy of what, how it existed three centuries before Christ, and that's very important from our, from our prophetic point of view of understanding the fulfillment of those prophecies by the person of Jesus Christ. With his uh, crucifixion and the fall of Jerusalem, they have the council, of the, the Hebrews have a council at Yamnia where they uh, codify their scriptures to what becomes later, the Mes about the 8th, 9th century, the, Mes uh, the Masoretic text that becomes the Hebrew reliance for our Bible. When you get to about the 3rd century, obviously the Greek gets translated into Latin, called the Old Latin, but it's subsequently uh, codified into what's called the Vulgate, which takes advantage of not only the Old Latin, but it takes advantage of two other things. It takes advantage of Textus Receptus, and it takes advantage of the products out of Yamnia, which are become the Masoretic text. So the Vulgate is rel relatively highly regarded. As you move into the more, into, uh, after, into the medieval era, with Tyndale and all those other guys, they're drawing, of course, upon um, the Vulgate in large measure. They have the Texas Receptus and the Masoretic also. You, when you finally get to the King James Bible, the translators there have access then to the Vulgate, of course, to the Tyndale Bibles and all of that, and they also have the, Septuagint, uh, the Texas Receptus, of course, and they have the Masoretic text. Now, let's go back to Alexandria with his Alexandrian codices. You know, it's interesting, Satan's strategy always has been one of creating doubt. Yea, hath God said, and uh, with additions or amendments or what have you. In 55 AD, the twisting already begins. 2 Peter 2 deals with that. You can just put in your notes, in the interest of time, we'll keep moving here. One of the things that starts happening is that the Greek philosophy and concepts are starting to be Im embedded in the attitudes and, uh, of the, uh, the people at that time. And so they're beginning to disparage the existing writings of both the Old Testament and the New. And uh, one of the centers for these kinds of, this introduction of Greek thought was, of course, Alexandria. And uh, the Gnostics, as they're called, they call themselves, implying that they know and you don't, their knowledge was kept sort of secret. You had to be part of the in-group to really know what they're dealing with here. They had an attitude that all material is evil, and uh, they tried to distance themselves from the material universe and so on. And thus Christ was not really God in the flesh. Jesus was really just a phantom, uh, only had the appearance of being there. He didn't leave footprints in the sand, and they had all these crazy ideas that came. Gnosticism is actually a collection of all kinds of bizarre ideas. It's not a unified presentation, but much of uh, it, it's a, it was a strange mix of what you and I would consider a new age and, uh, and also the Greek philosophies mixed in with appearance of Christianity. And this was gaining momentum even before John died, because his letter, his first epistle of John, uh, deals with this in several places. His, his first epistle is pretty much a, a rebuttal of Gnosticism. But um, one of the things the Gnostics did is they expurgated the Scriptures. They, they, they would delete things from the Scriptures. They were known for mutilating the Scriptures. In 156 AD, Irenaeus said of the Gnostics, quote, Wherefore they and their followers have betaken themselves to mutilating the Scriptures, which they themselves have shortened. In other words, I want you to be aware of the fact that one of the practices of the Gnostics was to delete portions of the Scripture. And uh, so the headquarters for the Gnostics was Alexandria. It was a major center of influence. Now these codices, as I've mentioned, these three Alexandrian codices, are the primary reliance of most modern translations. And uh, one of the things that we're going to discover is that in the, in the uh, tides or attitudes of scholarship, um, 
in the 19th century, more and more, uh, there was a disparagement of Textus Receptus and a veneration of the Alexandrian codices, saying that the Alexandrian codices were the oldest complete manuscript. We'll lean more on them and less on Textus Receptus. That was fashionable up until maybe 10 years ago, and we're going to see what the benefit of that is. Textus Receptus begins to get dethroned when Johannes Albert Bengel in the 1730s produced a text that deviated from Textus Receptus, relying on earlier manuscripts. In 1831, Carl Lachman produced a text that represented the 4th century Alexandrian codices. And then Trigellus, who was a self-taught in Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, spent his lifetime publishing a Greek text that came out uh, before the end of the 19th century. But the point is, these Alexandrian codices that uh, uh, emerged, um, uh, well, they were presumably actually were codified in the 4th, 5th century. They were discovered in the, in the 16th, 17th century are beginning to influence the modern translations, the NIV and others. And so the question is, are they really reliable? It has been very fashionable to lean heavily on these codices and less on Texas Receptus, and let's see what the differences are. There are two guys that you'll hear a lot about. There's a guy by the name of Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, Westcott and Hort. They were Anglican churchmen, and they had contempt for Texas Receptus. And uh, so they began a work in 1853. After 28 years, they spent in a Greek New Testament based on Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, the two of the, the what we now regard as corrupt manuscripts. They were influenced by Oregon and others who denied the deity of Jesus Christ. They embraced the Gnostic heresies of the period from the headquarters of the Gnostics in Alexandria. There are over 3,000 contradictions in the four Gospels alone between these manuscripts. They changed the traditional Greek in over 8,000 places. Now, Westcott and Hort, they found, just to give you some background on these two characters, they're regarded by, as the greatest Greek scholars and so forth. Let's look into this a little bit. They founded the Hermes Club, where they venerated the messenger of the gods, the guide for departed souls. In 1851, they started a guild at Cambridge, quote, to conduct serious and earnest inquiry into the nature of supernatural phenomenon. Call that spiritism, all right? And uh, Westcott's son said his father's, quote, faith in what, for a better name, one must call spiritism, close quote. In a letter to Archbishop Canterbury, Westcott wrote, quote, no one now, I suppose, hold that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. So the point is they're not believers. In April 3rd, 1860, Hart wrote, but the book which has engaged me most is Darwin. What may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be contemporary with. My feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. This is Hort's view. How about the universal fatherhood of God? Westcott believed that the universal fatherhood of God, in reference to John 10, 28, and 29, he wrote, the thought which is concrete in verse 28 is here traced back to its most absolute form as resting on the essential power of God in his relation of universal fatherhood. Westcott said Christians were Christ. Christians are themselves, in a true sense, Christ. That's his Christology. <laughs> Hort said, I am inclined to think that no such state as Eden, I mean the popular notion, ever existed, and that Adam's fall in no degree differed from the fall of each of his descendants. He also wrote to Westcott, I entirely agree, having many years believed that the absolute union of Christian, or rather of man, with Christ himself is the spiritual truth of which the the popular doctrine of substitution is an immoral and material counterfeit. Certainly, noting could be, uh, uh, certainly nothing could be more unscriptural than the modern limiting of Christ bearing, on our sins, bearing our sins and suffering to his death. But that is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. This is the, these are the guys we're talking about here. Or says, I confess I have, no repug I have no repugnance to the primitive doctrine of ransom paid to Satan, though neither am I prepared to give full assent to it. But I can see no other possible form in which the doctrine of a ransom is at all tenable. Anything is better than the notion of a ransom paid to the Father. So that's uh, his reference to Matthew 20. And Hort writes to uh, another letter. He says, Finally, St. Paul's mysterious words, Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. I have labored so utterly to apprehend in any measure what th his, this idea is. That I hope you will deepen and widen the hints you have already given. I am quite conscious that I have given but few distinct objections to the common belief, redemption through the blood of the Lamb, 
in what I have written. But so indeed it must be, language cannot accurately define the, tw the twinge of shrinking horror which mixes with my thought when I hear the popular notion of sudden. Westcott denies the sinlessness of Christ. He says the concept is that of bringing Christ to the full perfection of his humanity, which carries with it the completeness of power and dignity. The perfection was not reached till after death. Boy. And again, Westcott says, the resurrection seems to me to be the image of man unfallen to a higher life, not future but present. Not I shall be hereafter, but I am. Again, very new age. I have been persuaded for many years that the Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common with their causes and results. And also from what he says, the pure Romish view seems to be nearer and more likely to lead to truth than the evangelical. And then Hort even is recorded as having seen purgatory is a great important truth. These are the guys. Hort denies that heaven is literal. It's hardly necessary to say that this whole local language is figurative folly. And he goes on. The true lesson is that language which speaks of a ransom is but figurative. And Hort uh, says that appearance of Christ is figurative. Nothing is nothing in either this passage or others on the same subject apart from the figurative language of the Thessalonians to show that the revelation here spoken of is to be limited to a sudden prenatural theophany. It may be long and varying process, though ending in a climax. And uh, he described Texas Receptus as vile and villainous, and on it goes. How certainly I, this is the one part he says that I agree with. Westcott admits, quote, how certainly I should have been proclaimed a heretic, close quote. Amen. You should have been. Now the question you want to answer, would you let either one of these guys teach your Sunday school class? I don't think so. And so they may know a lot about Greek, but they certainly don't know much about the Bible. I want to show you in Westcott and Hort's tra famous translations what was deleted. Matthew 6.13, the entire verse in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That is deleted by Westcott and Hort. In Matthew 18, verse 11, Christ's mission, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Entire verse, deleted. Matthew 23, 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a, pe a pretense make a long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. The scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, is deleted for some reason. <laughs> Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. What's deleted is wherein the Son of Man cometh. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. For what? <laughs> See, it's it doesn't make sense. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What they deleted was the Son of God. And then uh, repentance. Jesus heard it and said to them, they that are whole have no need for a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Two repentances dropped. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Hey, sinners! <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Unless you're a Gnostic. Mark 9, 44, the entire verse is deleted. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. They're deleting our eternal judgment here. Mark eleven twenty six. 26, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. The entire verse, deleted. Here's a subtle one, Luke 2, 23. Your Bible says, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him, him being Christ. In the Westcott and Hort, they changed Joseph to father. And father and his mother, his father and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. So what they're trying to do, what? what's the difference? The virgin birth. See, it's subtle, but they're, they're hammering away at it. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. According to Westcott and Hort, man shall not live by bread alone, but by God. Not every word of God. Again, it's, it's, some of these things are more subtle than others. Luke 24, 40, and when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. The entire thing is deleted to cloud this whole issue of a tangible resurrection. John 3, 15, that whosoever believes him should not perish, but have eternal life. So they should not perish. See, again, they're trying to eliminate that punishment. Acts 2, 30, therefore being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sin on his throne. According to the flesh, deleted Again, to make, bring this into conformance to the Gnostic prejudices. Acts 8. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And what was deleted was that he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That was what the Ethiopian treasurer had said. In Acts 9, verses 5 and 6, the entire Paul's call, deleted. 
Well, he, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling a star, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said, Rise and go to the city, and shall be told thee what thou shalt do. That whole pair of verses deleted. Romans 14, 9, And for this end Christ both died and rose, and both and rose deleted. They agreed that he died. Okay. And uh, Ephesians 3, 9, To make all these men see what is the fellowship of the mystery that from which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things. What's deleted is by Jesus Christ. Again, ascribing the creation to none other than Jesus Christ. They delete it. For this cause I bow my knees to, unto the Father, and they delete of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter 1.22, they delete through the Spirit, saying, Ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth unto feigned love. Try obeying the truth through unfeigned love without the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they missed the whole point. For as much as Christ has suffered for us, the for us is deleted. And again, 1 John 5, 7 and 8. For the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. These two verses are deleted in a number of manuscripts, incidentally. Westcott and Hart are the only ones, but still, that's, that's their view. And Re Revelation eleven seventeen, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast, and art to come is deleted. We give thanks, O Lord, which art, which exists and used to exist, but nothing about the future. Not a big deal, but it's obviously prejudicial. I want to pause here for a minute and suggest an exercise. I want you to imagine taking a sheet of paper, and I want you to create from fiction, from your imagination, a genealogy. And um, how many could do that? You could just cre create a family tree. Right? All of you. Okay, sure. Except I'm going to give you a few rules. I want, when you're through and turn in your paper, I want the number of words that you put in your little assignment, your imaginary family tree here, I want the number of words to be exactly divisible by seven. In other words, count the number of words, divide by seven, you have no remainder. So you have seven or 14 or 28 or 35, whatever number of words you want, but it's divisible by seven without a remainder. You follow me? Doesn't too, it shouldn't be too hard to do. You can fudge that, right? If you take a random example, you've got six chances of losing and one of winning. For a number, to, a total to end up, there's six chances that it doesn't, that it has a remainder. You follow me? There's six chances of losing one of winning. But that's okay. You can fudge that around, right? But I want the number of letters that you've used to also be divisible by seven exactly without a remainder. That's a little trickier. That takes a little fussing around, but let's assume you could do that. I'm not through. I want the number of vowels and the number of consonants, most, both must be divisible by seven. See, if, if one's true, the other will be true, but okay. Number of words that begin with a vowel should be divisible by seven. Number of words that begin with a consonant must be divisible by seven. Here again, if one's true, the other will be true, all right. The number of words that occur more than once must be divisible by seven. Now that's getting a little complicated, okay. Those that occur in more than one form must be divisible by seven, exactly. Those that occur in only one form, divisible by seven. The number of nouns shall be divisible by seven. Only seven words will not be nouns. How many, anybody still playing? See, each time I put a rule down, it complicates it. Uh, it, 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 it makes it tougher. The number of names shall be divisible by seven, and only seven other kinds of nouns will be permitted. The number of male names shall be seven. The number of generations shall be divisible by seven. And you've probably guessed what I've done here already. This happens to be describing the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the first 11 verses of the Gospel of Matthew. But incidentally, it's not in English. It's in Greek, which is far more rigid and far more difficult to make fit because it has so many uh, syntactical rules. And so this is, a, uh, this is an example um, these are the discoveries, this, this, what's called the heptatic structure, the sevenfold structure, was dis uh, discovered by Ivan Panin. He was born in Russia on December 12th of 1855. He exiled from Russia at an early age. He got tangled up in a plot against the Tsar. So he emigrated to Germany and ultimately to the United States. He graduated from Harvard with a PhD in mathematics in 1882. But along the way, he discovered Jesus Christ. Now, 
every one of us in this room that have discovered Jesus Christ are the result of a miracle of God's initiative. But if you're a PhD from Harvard, that's even a bigger miracle. <laughs> but he did discover Christ, and he also discovered the heptatic structure of, of uh, the t biblical text in 1890. And he devoted the rest of his life into exploring the text. And uh, he generated 43,000 pages, with very small handwriting, by the way. It was very dense material. 43,000 pages of discoveries. Candidly, they're very tedious to go through, because you can quickly get into all these numbers and things. But in that, there are some incredible gems. The one I've just given you is one of those. But uh, he went to his Lord on October 30th, 1942. Incredible, incredible genius, and we're greatly indebted to his insights. But the reason I wanted to give you this background, I want to talk to you about the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark. Take your Bible and look up the last 12 verses of Mark, and I believe you'll find in the marginal notation a footnote to the effect that these last 12 verses were probably added by some scribe. They're certainly in some dispute. There's some kind of uh, doubt, especially if you have one of the modern translations. There's an issue where these last 12 verses of Mark, because these last 12 verses of Mark do not appear in Westcott and Hort. And they promote the idea that these were probably added by some well-meaning, probably good intentions, but some scribe in later centuries. Because they don't show up in these 4th century manuscripts called the Alexandrian Codices. And so, what about them? They either... Either they were added later, or they were deleted in Alexandria. Now, Westcott and Hort, of course, argue that it's a later, Mark uh, uh, 16, verses 9 to 20 is a later edition. Now, I can destroy this by going to history, because Irenaeus, in 150 AD, several centuries before the Alexandrian codices, he quotes these verses in his commentary. So that tells you right there that the Alexandrian codices are are uh, spurious, of dubious, and uh, either that or Irenaeus was clairvoyant, that he predicted that these verses would be added later, <laughs> okay? And I'm not through there, Hippolytus in the second century also comments on these verses, several hundred years before the Alexandrian codices. So this, from a historical point of view, puts a cloud on the validity of the Alexandrian codices that Westcott and Hort, of course, uh, expound. Now. Let's just take a quick look at this passage, starting at verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. He said to them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Period. End of the gospel. That's where Westcott and Hort would say, that ends the gospel. Verse 9 and following were added later. That's, their, that's the presentation. And your Bibles may have a footnote of that effect. Let's see what was added later, presumably. And she went and told them that had been with him, and they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it be, uh, unto the residue, and neither believed uh, they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said to them, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, they shall cast out devils, they shall speak in new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Then, so then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the Word with signs following, amen. End of the gospel. Wow. Here is that text we just read. One way to divide it, verses 9 and 10 are the appearance to Mary, 
and verses 11 to 18 are subsequent appearances, and then we have the conclusion, verses 19 to 20. Another way to divide it up would be to say the first, from verse 11 to 14, is simple narrative. Verses 15 to 18 is Christ's discourse to them, and then you have the final two verses wrapping it up. Those are two ways of parsing that document. I want to show you an authentication system. There's an automatic security monitor that's watching over every letter of the text. It doesn't wear, rust or wear out. It's been running continually for several thousand years, and it's there to protect you. It's a fingerprint signature of the author. You ready for this? Let's take a look. And it's a, it's a non-compromisable design. Knowing this design, I challenge you to um, uh, try to f outfox it here. The sevens in the Bible, they occur in over seven, 600 passages, some overt, some structural, some hidden. Their, uh, their heptatic signatures are a signature, I believe, of God. First of all, if we look at those last 12 verses that Westcott and Hort say were added, there's 175 words involved in the Greek. And by the way, 175 happens to be a multiple of 7 exactly. It's 7 times 25. The vocabulary, if you list, make a list of all the words that appear, there's 98 different words. That's 7 times 7 times 2. How many letters are there? There's 553. That's a multiple of 7 exactly. If some ancient scribe was trying to do this by hand, he's got a challenge. But we've got some more to go here. The vowels are 294, it's a multiple of 7 exactly. The consonants are 259, a multiple of 7 exactly. The total vocabulary, as I said, was 98. 84 were found earlier in Mark, it's a multiple of 7. There are 14 that are found only here. There are 42 that was used in the Lord's Address. There were 56 that are not part of His vocabulary. Now I've given you nine rules so far, okay? Now, the chance, if I have two rules, the chance, one rule, you have six chances of losing, one of winning. If I have two rules, you've got one chance in 49 of winning, 48 of losing. It's seven squared. If I have three rules, it's seven cubed. It's one chance in 343 of having this happen by mistake or by accident. If you have four, it's 2,401, and you get the idea. It, it goes up as the exponentiation. For these nine rules, you've got one chance in over 40 million of it happening, occurring by just random accident. Now, I will point out that several of these are mutually exclusive. If one's true, the other's true. There's a few of those. But we're, I'm going to show you we're all going to be, uh, we have a factor of two working in our favor here. Now, would you like to try this? Would you like to take, try to get, you've got uh, one chance in 40 million of getting it right by accident. We want to try to do this. Let's assume you're working eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a week. I'll give you two weeks off for vacation. That's 2,000 man hours a year or 120,000 minutes per year. How long will it take you to do a draft, a candidate draft of those 12 verses? You've got to do 40 million attempts, presumably, to get it right. If you do an average of, if it takes you an average of 10 minutes per draft, that's pretty quick. Then you, only, then you need about 3,362 years. In other words, to do, to do this by hand is obviously absurd. But I'm not through yet. It gets worse. It gets a lot worse. I remember I, I said that you can divide this by appearance to Mary, the subsequent appearance, the conclusion, or you can divide it by a simple narrative, Christ's discourse, or the conclusion. That's, I said there were 175 words before. In the address of the Lord, there's 56. The rest of the passage, 119. Verses 9 to 11, that grouping, there's 35 uh, words. There's 12 to 18, there's 105. Each one of these groupings is a multiple of 7. Verse 12 alone is 14, a multiple of 7, 13 to 15, 35. Each one of these pa words, each one of these sections, if you will, includes words that are exact multiple of 7. Now, Greek, like the Hebrew, has a numerical value assigned to each of its letters. And... Uh, so again, this gets into geometry, as they call it, or geometrical values. The total geometrical value, if you take those numerical values and add up the values of the 12 verses of Mark, it adds up to 106,663. Guess what? That's a multiple of 7 exactly. Verses 9 to 11, verse 9 alone, verse 10, the first word, the middle word, the last word, uh, verse 11, each of these parsings, the geometrical value is a multiple of seven exactly. The chances of you pulling this off 
is pretty slim, obviously, because of the, the complexity involved. I talked about vocab in 98 words, not before Mark was 14, found later in the New Testament seven words in 35 occurrences. The numerical, numerical value of those is 8,246, a multiple of seven exactly. And on it goes and goes, as you get the idea. Total number of forms, 133. The value of those total forms is a multiple of seven exactly. Those that occur more than once, only once. In fact, when they occur more than once, they occur 63 times. That's also a multiple of seven exactly. And on it goes. There's one word here that occurs only here in the New Testament, no other place. And it has a numerical value of 581. Guess what? That's also a multiple of seven exactly. It's preceded by a vocabulary of 42. And, by, and anyway, each one of these is a multiple of seven exactly. And I've given you 34 rules, okay? You say, Chuck, some of those were mutually exclusive. That's okay. Pannon has identified 75. I'm just taking half, less than half of them, all right? Let's assume you want to still try. You're going to need 7 to the 34th power. That's 5 times 10 with 28 zeros after it. There are 3 times 10 to the 7th seconds per year. I'm going to give you a supercomputer. Let's assume you've got a very fast computer that can do 400 million tries per second. It can formulate a candidate session, a section of text. Um, it can do 400 million of those per second, okay? But we've got at four times, that's four times 10 to the eighth tries per second. It's still going to take four times 10 to the 12th computer years, or put it another way, you need one million of those supercomputers operating for 4.3 million years. I'm trying to just get across how quickly those statistics go beyond the realm of practicality, become absurd, if you will. And incidentally, I've only used 34 of the distinctive features. Pannon catalogs 75 of them. So admittedly, some of those, there's a few of those that are mutually dependent. You know, if you've got, if you've got the total number of words, uh, 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 multiple of seven, and then you take vowels, and vowels fit, then consonants will too, obviously. You follow me? So there's some of those that will derive. So there's a few of those that are dependent variables, but if you threw those out, we're still talking about a two-to-one ratio here. So this is, we're way out, way out of thing. Now, I want to give you some other examples here. The New Testament um, consists of 27 books, right? So each book ends and begins with a word. Begins and ends with a word. Well, of the 27 books, there's 54 words, right? If I take the first and last word of each of the 27 books. That turns out to be a vocabulary of 28 different words. That's a multiple of seven exactly. And in the Gospels, it's a multiple of seven exactly. The geometrical value of those words is a multiple of seven exactly. The shortest word, which is one letter, has a, multiple, has a value of seven. It's a multiple of seven exactly. The longest word in the New Testament is a, a word that is, has a value of 1,512, which, by the way, is seven times six times six times six. Then the word is apocalypsis. Kind of interesting. <laughs> but this is the one of all these that really blows me away. There's a vocabulary that's unique to Matthew. If I make a list of the words that Matthew uses and isolate those words that only Matthew uses and the other writers of the New Testament don't use them, I come up with a list of 42 words. That's a multiple of seven exactly. And by the way, those 42 words, uh, words, we've got 126 letters. Again, a multiple of seven exactly. Now, let's assume for the moment that Matthew contrived to do that deliberately. How would you go about it? The only thing that these words have in common is they're not used by any of the other guys. There's two ways he could do that. One way is to get all the other guys to agree not to use these 42 words. How many of you think that happened? I don't think so. The other way he could do it on purpose or deliberately is make sure he did his writing last. So he has all the other books in front of him and he goes through all the rigmarole and decides, you know, he adjusts to make this happen. That's not very likely either, obviously. So I can use, he either did this by prior agreement or his written as last. I could use this as an argument that Matthew's gospel had to be written last. Okay? So the gospel of Matthew has, a, has letter, the, word, the words that are unique to him that nobody uses multiple seven exactly. The trouble is, so is the Gospel of Mark. It was written last. 
And so was the Gospel of Luke, written last. And so was the Gospel of John, written last. Now you're laughing, because obviously that's absurd. The fact that they could contrive this is absurd in the first place. It's a fingerprint of the Holy Spirit, I believe. And James, Peter, Jude, and Paul each wrote last, because each one of these has words that are unique to them that are multiple of seven exactly. So, now there are words that are multiple of seven exactly if and only if you take the Old and New Testament together. The, name, the word hallelujah occurs 24 times in the Old Testament, four times in the New. That's 28, multiple of seven exactly. Hosanna, shepherd, Jehovah Sabaoth, and so on. You go through these words, they're multiple of seven exactly if you take the Old and New Testament together only so. God says, ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Deuteronomy 4, 2. He also said, Deuteronomy, what things soever I command you observe to do it, thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. God means what he says and says what he means. The words of the Lord are pure words, as a silver tried in the furnace of the earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Uh, in Psalm 138, I will worship toward the holy temple, praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. I love this one. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. If you know how God feels about his name, then this really has huge weight. He says, thou hast magnified thy word even above thy name. He takes his word seriously. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Proverbs 30, verse 6. The grass withereth, the flower faith, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Isaiah 48. Jeremiah, thus saith the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak unto all the cities of Judah which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word, he tells Jeremiah. Revelation 22, I testify to every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy... God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Mark 8. Sir Frederick Kenyon, the noted expert, summarized it, and he says, We have in our hands in substantial integrity, the veritable Word of God. Indeed, praise God. And of course, the Westcott and Hort, that's why we, that's one of the reasons that your newest translations lean too heavily on Westcott and Hort. And one of the things that's happening in the scholastic community is Texas Receptus is reestablishing itself as authoritative. And that's why you, there are many modern translations and they're worth, they're readable. But you will just, if you're maturing spiritually, you'll outgrow them. And what everybody overlooks in those versions is the question of Scripture memory. I'm glad when I was a kid, teenager, and the Revised Standard Version came out that I was well advised to avoid it. And I'm glad I didn't do my scriptural memory in RSV, because today it's, it's an also ran. So it's not so much the problems with, every uh, translation has its difficulties, the King James also, but the difficulties are well understood and well known. But if you're going to do scripture memory work, and, this, and God says in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And many passages suggest memory work. If you're going to do memory work, you want to do it in a, in a version that you know will be around 10, 20 years from now. And uh, these modern translations are useful, but they keep getting eclipsed by better modern translations. And uh, uh, who knows? You know, I'm on the review committee for the International Standard Version. And it's, it's got some advantages, but 10 years from now, there may be a better, and a better, and a better, and a better. But I do my scripture memory and, and I anchor it in something that, whose majesty is still unequaled and one that'll be around. So that's an unusual argument. Why do we accept the Bible? Because it's authenticated by Jesus Christ. And uh, we first have authenticated Christ because of the detailed specifications he fulfilled, and, and uh, Daniel 70 weeks being the best example, and then having authenticated him in our minds, then it's authenticated by Christ in the Torah and elsewhere. That closes the loop, if you will. An integrated design of transcendental origin. 66 books penned by 40 guys over several thousand years. 
a design that anticipates in detail events before they happen from outside our time domain. And so we have these hidden authentication codes that we've talked about. But how can you tell yourself? Jesus tells you in John 7:17, 7, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So having tried to at least give us a feeling for where we got our Bible, the next briefing pack you might want to explore is how to study the Bible and how do we deal with these things in ourselves practically. We have done a book, as I've indicated, which has cryptography background and uh, it uh, goes into the microcodes and the macrocodes and the metacodes and so forth and how to search them for yourself if you want to go down that path. In any case, I do encourage you to do a study on how to study the Bible. There are things that are very, very helpful, ways to avoid falling in the potholes alongside the road. So let's don't stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word, how precious it is. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to gather together without fear, that we can assemble without threat of death, as so many in the past have had to do. We thank you, Father, for this Bible has come to us at such a high price. We thank you for the extremes that you've gone to that we might have life in Jesus Christ. We do pray, Father, that you would increase in each of us a new hunger, a new appetite for your word, that we each might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that we each might become more fruitful stewards of the opportunities ahead of us. But in all these things, Father, we, without any reservation, commit ourselves into your hands. Indeed, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.